Good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Redman. I'm an alcoholic. Everybody hear me? My friend Cliff was at a meeting once, and a, at a speaker meeting, and a, a guy in the back yelled out, I can't hear you to the speaker, and a guy up front said, I can hear him. Let's switch seats. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I don't know uh, if it's good or bad that you can hear me, but you'll be the judge of that uh, later on. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, this group so much for inviting me down, for taking such good care of me and making me feel so welcome. I, uh, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. I, I, all I got is good news today. That's all I got. I, I, all I got is good news. And um, uh, I've got some dear old friends here, people I've known for a long time who mean a, uh, just a tremendous amount to me. And I've got some new friends, um, uh, Randy, who I've took my clothes off in front of and um, I'm not even going to explain that. And uh, <laughs> Randy, if I do become gay, you, I don't even think you're on the list. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I just to, just to start off with, I've been asked to share my experience with the steps. Uh, that's what I'm going to endeavor to do. I, do, I didn't come here to insult or offend anyone. I got no bone to pick. I'm not here to tell you how to do it. I don't know how you should do it. I know how I'm, I've been doing it, how I'd like to continue to do it. Um, so if I use the phrase you at all, I apologize in advance. You know, um, on, on page 29, it says, each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. Uh, these give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. We hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages and believe, and we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, quote, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. That's the only reason that I'm here to make a demonstration, bear witness, and tell you how this has been operating in my life. Um, last, on April 22nd, I turned 22 years sober, uh, continuous sobriety, and uh, I'm absolutely astounded by that. And um, if you're new here, I am not as close to my next drink as you are. I'm not. I only have till 12 o'clock tonight. Don't get me wrong. I'm not cured. But your drinking muscle's a lot stronger than mine. You've been working out. My not drinking muscle is a lot stronger than yours because I've been in the spiritual gym for 22 years. And I'm not putting you down. When I was new, that was good news. I wanted to know that you, with some time, with some continuous time, building up and developing these not drinking muscles and this spiritual development and this feeling of being connected. You know, I had this insane idea that I could have a successful life being separated from you. And then I've had the un incredibly painful experience of being separated in AA. When I, I, I have actually done AA better than you on several occasions. I, I've been over sober. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and it's very painful. It's very painful to be the best member of AA. <laughs> the head drunk. It's like being voted most attractive man on your cell block, kind of. It's, it's an honor, but you don't want to pick the award up. You know? <laughs> I'm going to talk, you know, for 97 hours today. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't mean to bore you, but God knows, if you're not bored at least part of the time, then you're probably on drugs. Um, <laughs> uh, so I want to start by telling my favorite uh, story about being bored in AA. I, um, this old friend named Jeff D. in my old home group, and um, he uh, was a couple of weeks sober, and he was at our home group, and he was shifting around in his seat, and his sponsor said, what's the matter? And Jeff said, I'm bored. And his sponsor said, well, you know why you're bored. He said, no, why? And Jeff and his sponsor said, uh, you're bored because you're boring. That's why you're bored. And it blew his mind. It was like an acid moment for him. He went, wow, just freaked him out, you know. And he, he thought, what a great thing to say to a newcomer. And he could hardly wait till the newcomer told him that they were bored. 
And uh, 13 years later, a new- newcomer has told him that they're bored. And he's at an AA meeting with a young lady who was new, and she looks really uncomfortable, and he says to her, what's the matter? And she said, uh, I'm bored. I said, well, you know why you're bored? She said, yeah, because I'm with you. That's why I'm bored. So if you're bored, it's probably because you're with you. Uh, or uh, I'm really boring. That's possible also. I don't want to. I don't want to count that out. Um, I have a physical allergy to alcohol. It makes it impossible for me to control and enjoy or, or moderate. And if that was my my big problem, I'd be in pretty good shape uh, because there are great physical treatments, fabulous doctors, terrific medications that you can take for allergies and. That I'd be in pretty good shape, but my problem is much worse than that. Um, I have a bizarre mental twist that makes it impossible for me to control and enjoy or moderate, and I start thinking myself into taking a, a drink that I can't stop taking. And if that was my problem, I mean, if my mental state was my problem, again, I'd be my life would be a lot simpler. There's a lot of psychotropic drugs I can take to treat that stuff. There's therapies. They work for millions of people. But my problem is far, far worse than that. Because I have this allergy that, that, uh, uh, where I, I can't stop and because I have this thinking that uh, it means I can't stop starting, I developed this cancer of the soul, this uh, spiritual tapeworm. And how it presents is it presents as a uh, a self-centeredness that eclipses everything good in my life. On page 62 in the big book of AA, I believe it sums up the uncivilized mindset of the the dying alcoholic better than anything I've ever read. And uh, it says near the top of the page, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, driven. Driven isn't nudged or influenced. Driven is under the lash of in slavery too. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows, and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably, invariably means without variation, without a loophole, every time, invariably find that at some time in the past we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. Let me qualify that right away, okay? I'm resentful at Nazis for slaughtering Jews during World War II. Have I made a decision based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt? Well, no. Is, do I have a part in that? Well, no. Is it my fault? Absolutely not. <clears throat> I said to my sponsor. <laughs> and he said to me, you don't understand the question that you've been asked. They're not asking you if the event was your fault. They're asking you if the resentment is your fault. Was the event your fault? Absolutely not. I'm resentful at my aunt for abusing me when I was three. Is the event my fault? You know, a lot of people could look at that and try to come up with a way, well, you were a bratty kid or that and that. I don't buy it. I don't buy it's okay to to do that to a three-year-old kid. I don't think it's excusable. That's why they call you a grown-up. Was the event my fault? Absolutely not. Is the resentment my fault? Every time, without variation and no loophole. Because there's a huge difference between being, having a resentment and, uh, and objecting. There's a big difference between excusing and forgiving. There are a lot of uh, activities or actions that are not excusable. But if they're not forgivable, I'm a dead man. I'll die. I'll die all alone in this horrible, painful little paper cut of a spiritually sick brain of mine. So I've got to be rid of this selfishness. So our troubles are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, again on page 62, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. (laughs) Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. This is the first of five direct um, death threats that are made in the big book. Uh, it gets worse as you progress through chapter 5. He just They keep threatening your life in very subtle, loving ways. But this is the first really big one. 
It must do it kills us. No big deal. You just get to die. God makes that possible, and there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of, uh, uh, of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own willpower. We had to have God's help. And, boy, is that, that's so true and particularly true when it comes to prayer because many times in my sobriety I've tried to pray things away without taking certain specific actions that I need to take and making certain demonstrations. And sometimes prayer is a wish. And uh, I've become sort of a um, chasing my own tail spiritually. And it's been interesting to see how that plays out for me. Um, there's a, a book. By the way, I'm going to be uh, talking a, about... Um, different spiritual teachers today and unapproved uh, AA literature. And again, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, and I'm not telling you what to do. I've been asked to share my experience with the steps, so I'm going to be sharing them. Step 11 says go and talk to people and talk to ministers and rabbis and see what they've got out there. And I'm going to be talking, when I talk about 11 today, I'm going to be talking about some of the spiritual teachers that I've gone to. I've never done anything, I can honestly say, instead of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm a member of other 12-step programs. I've, I use a lot of different spiritual teachers. I can honestly say to you, everything I've done is because of AA, not instead of AA. Um, one of the things that's happened, can I see uh, hands of people in their first year? Wow, it's fantastic. One to five? Five to 20? Wow, over 20? Wow, that's fantastic. One of the things that I have found um, with people later on in sobriety is there are times when, um, when people go over and over the same material uh, in AA and it starts to fall apart in their hands and it starts to come flat and gray and wooden and they start trying to figure out why, is this not, why doesn't this feel the same? So one of the things I've done is I've, I've been very attracted to teachers who've come up with really exciting ways to reinvigorate their experience of the steps later on in sobriety, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. My sponsor, uh, before he passed away, he had about 33 years of sobriety, and he was calling me on the phone all the time going, I got this book, I got this thing, let's try this thing, let's go here. He was like a nutty eight-year-old, you know, he was over 80 years old. That's, that's what I want. That's really what I want. Anytime anybody puts their finger in my chest in AA and says that's the way it is and, that, and if you question it, you're in danger, I go, thanks for sharing, and I get the heck away from them. I've stayed away from those guys for 22 years. I've also stayed away from, there were some old-timers in my area when I was getting sober who were the uh, shut up, you're a moron, if your lips are moving, you're lying, and uh, I've stayed away from that for 22 years. I, I've had no use for that at all. And there was this idea in that group at that time that those guys were very wise, their grumpiness was born of sort of this weathered, extended experience they had. And until I stayed sober long enough just to find out that they were just really pissed off and really mean, um, I, I, I attached this other value, which was all in my head. I never heard it from them. I never heard them. They never taught me anything about inventory. They never taught me anything about self-examination and admission and compliance and demonstration. You know, they just showed up and played pinochle. And, you know, thank God I'm so spiritually developed, I judge no man. I, uh, so. <laughs> you know, there's a difference between an evaluation and a judgment. And um, <laughs> sometimes the line can get wavy. And... Um, an evaluation for me is, you know, to evaluate the truth and, and see what's going on. And a judgment is injurious to me because it means I attach a value to it. And um, I try to be an evaluator rather than a judger. <laughs> There's a, a book of uh, mental disorders. And um, this book of mental disorders, if your mental disorder is in this book, um, you can actually use your mental disorder as a defense in court. Um, it's a really good book. And uh, there is a, a kind of a new one. It's just been on the books for a couple of years, and it's called Narcissistic Personality Disorder. And it's used, it's been, <laughs> uh, and I want to read to you the nine of the um, 
uh, of the symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder that people are using as defenses in, in court. It's not working, by the way, very well. Now, I, don't, I have, <laughs> but um, just see if this resonates for you at all. And this is in the book. This is technically in the book of stuff you can use in court to defend yourself. One, an exaggerated sense of self-importance. Uh, two, preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Three, believes that he or she is special and can only be understood by uh, or should associate with other special or high-status people. Four, requires excessive admiration. Everybody, anybody got this so far? Uh, six, selfishly takes advantage of others to achieve his or her uh, uh, ends. Seven, lacks empathy. Eight, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. And nine, shows arrogant, haughty, patronizing, or contemptuous behavior or attitudes. Not guilty. <laughs> Nar narcissistic personality disorder. One other document I want to read to you, and it's one of my favorites. And uh, many people in early childhood development use this. It's called the Toddler Property Laws. And it's an attempt to uh, aid people instead of seeing toddlers as bad or stupid or crazy. And it's, it's the seven ways that toddlers will view, tend to view the world around them become, before they become more civilized. One, <coughs> if I like it, it's mine. <laughs> Two, if it's in my hand, it's mine. <laughs> Three, if I can take it from you, it's mine. <laughs> Isn't this just so great? Four, if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. <laughs> Welcome to the world of relationships. Um, five, five, if it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. Six, if I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. And seven, my favorite, if it looks just like mine, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, I must be rid of this selfishness or it kills me. I'm powerless over alcohol. My life has become unmanageable. It's such a simple statement and such a simple idea. And if it really was that simple, uh, there wouldn't be an empty seat here. Actually, there would be. The entire room would be empty because we had no need for Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, in, the, uh, in the packet um, that you were given this morning, if I can find it, just got too much paper that I'm probably never going to look at during the day. Thank you so much. In the third page, I want to read this prayer, and then I want to talk about it a bit. <clears throat> if I want to change, I must wake up. I have been asleep. I am seeing the problem in a cloud. I am letting it go below the horizon so that it does not present itself as a real problem. When I see it clearly, it will not be precious to me. I cannot live this way, knowing that this is wrong and continuing to do it. I must tell the truth about what I am doing. I have been willing to complain about it and to go on doing it. I must take it from a complaint to a piece of real business, make it a real problem. I must stand in front of it naked, make a surrender, take an inventory, make some kind of demonstration. This is not a small deal. I do not want to live like this. I'm a grown person. I have been unconscious. I have been slipping into this behavior. I have been acting without explanation. I must ask God to help keep this thing on a conscious level. I must elevate it in my consciousness and see it as a problem. Prayer is the measure of whether or not I'm in the game. Dear God, direct my will to what you want me to do. This friend of mine was working with a new guy a couple, some months ago, and um, noticed, the guy was a couple of weeks sober, he noticed this bruise on the guy's chest. He said, what happened? And the guy said, oh, I hit my, he opened his shirt, he had these huge purple bruises all over his torso. My buddy, you know, wanted to know what had happened, and the guy said, well, a couple of weeks ago when I got sober, I um, was going to kill myself, so I... Uh, I drank a bottle of vodka and I stole a vial of uh, nitroglycerin pills from a heart patient. By the way, that's the last time the heart patient comes up in a story. They're, he's collateral damage. He's off like flopping around like a boated face somewhere. But he stole this uh, vial of nitroglycerin pills. He swallowed the whole vial 
and then started slamming his body into the wall trying to blow himself up. Now, if you're new, you're going to hear some wacky stuff about alcoholism. And some of it makes sense to me, and some of it doesn't. And the stuff that doesn't make sense to me, I've never found in the big book of AA. I've heard that alcoholics don't like change, just don't like change of any kind. And um, I don't like change I don't like. But I, I love change. I've never heard anyone get to a podium and say, Oh, man, I hit the lottery. I'm having sex with identical twins. It's killing me. This change is just ripping me up. I've never, <laughs> never heard that. But my personal favorite is that um, alcoholics are above average intelligence. I have only heard this at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. <laughs> I have never heard it. Just ask Nitro how, uh, <laughs> how brilliant we are. <laughs> if his nickname isn't like Boom Boom or something like that, then his home group sucks, you know. <laughs> so I've got a physical allergy coupled with a mental obsession, and I've developed this spiritual sickness. What does that have to do with alcoholism? It actually is alcoholism. It's my reverse experience of step one. My life's completely unmanageable. I'm powerless over alcohol. I don't even know what's going on. I couldn't even give you a diagnosis. I have no idea what alcoholism is. What does that have to do with alcoholism? It actually is alcoholism. The spiritual sickness is the fifth wheel. It's the mystery element that has plucked me beyond the opportunity to be helped by well-meaning clergy, a family that adored me, a very successful career, um, wonderful members of the clergy, well-meaning psychological and medical doctors. Um, so this step one, this first step, which in me was born of complete deflation, defeat, confusion, uh, more than anything, I, you told me it was necessary to move forward, so I said, yeah, 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 good. I'm powerless. I'm powerless over alcohol. But I don't even get how bad my problem is because um, no matter what happens, eventually my alcoholism goes below the horizon, it stops presenting itself as a real piece of business, and I act without reason, without explanation. I drink, and I don't know why. And it can happen like that. I, I'm, a, I'm a rabbit in the middle of a field of short grass all the time, and I don't get it. And there are periods of time where it will remain above the horizon as a real piece of business because something wonderful or something horrible happens. It'll stay up there, but it's up there on my own juice. So eventually, it's going to go below the horizon. It's going to stop presenting as a real piece of business. It presents as a complaint. And then I act without reason and without explanation. And it happens over and over again. So my experience of step one is I had to admit that in order to move forward. And then, and you know, if you're new, or if you've been around for a while and this experience is starting to not be very vigorous, and it's starting to flatten out, and it's starting to go below the horizon. Um, I've got to do something. I've got to do something. And, you know, for me, at the end of the day, the, the, the interior, the, the landscape of this spiritual sickness, which is the mystery element, the fifth wheel, the thing that can't be touched by all these other conventional methodologies... The architecture of it is, res is resentment, fear, and sexual misconduct. This, this is not a wacky idea I came up with. It's pretty well laid out in the book. So if I'm treating my resentment, my fear, and my sexual misconduct, and I want to tell you, without, without step 10, there's no, there's no step 12 for me. I'm not going to be able to stay a happy, involved, invigorated member of Alcoholics Anonymous if I don't continue to take a look at my resentments because I get pissed off at people in AA. No, no, really, really. I have uh, gotten pissed off at people in AA and at uh, AA groups, and uh, particularly when I've been over sober. That has uh, really, um, really happened to me. And um, I'll tell you, man, to be uh, at this point in my life, um, when, and this is something that when I was new, you couldn't have explained to me because I had no relative experience. 
I, 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 to live relatively free of resentment, I, I wouldn't have even known how to take that into my brain. I, I had become so ill and had been so ill for so long. I'm resentful at them. I'm resentful at me for resenting them. I'm resentful at them for watching me resent them. Right? And I've had sex with all of them. Right? And I'm, and I'm, and I'm terrible. Um, and, um, and if I borrow money from you, I've got to kill you. You got to die, because um, you don't really need the money, you know. I don't really like you much anyway, you know. Um, and you multiply that by thousands, the thousands of people that had to die when I came in here. It's a, it's a great, it's wonderful design for living. <laughs> so my experience of step one was very rudimentary and very um, primitive when I first came in here, and it was enough to give me a day so that I could so that I could be opportunistic and I could start making this transition from the cycle of spree and remorse into the cycle of surrender and commitment. And that cycle of surrender and commitment, when it's nourished by this spiritual health, is something that can't be beat. It keeps people, it brings about a personality change that, that helps people accomplish one day at a time permanent sobriety. And when that cycle is not nourished, it goes below the horizon it stops presenting itself as a real piece of business, and I act without reason. Now, it's been my personal experience that the things that I have continued to suffer from as a member of AA are the things that remain complaints and don't become real pieces of business. There was some, um, in my first home group, there were a couple of really bad ideas one of the really bad ideas was that you can do anything in sobriety as long as you're willing to pay the price. First of all, the insane idea there is that you're able to pay the price. How do you know you're going to be able to pay the price? Just because you're willing to I was willing to pay a lot of prices I never paid. <laughs> you know, if that was the price of admission, you know, sure, sure, sure. But the crazy idea, since the big book it, it, it basically says, you know, the, 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 that, um, God, it says a lot of stuff, doesn't it? But it, it, it basically says that if you don't do this, it is going to go the, below the horizon. That, if you, that step three is a really nice idea, but if it's not followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things that have really, you know, these resentments, fears, and sexual misconduct, that there's no way that I'm going to be able to keep this on a conscious level. Even more than that, if I participate in the fellowship of AA, not the friendship. I, I'm really done with friendship. I, 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 I'm not interested in it anymore. I'm really not. Uh, there, there are people here today that I don't see very often. I don't see Beverly and, and, uh, and George very often at all. We move in and out of our connection effortlessly. Absolutely effortlessly. We have a spiritual connection. We, I don't have a friendship with either one of them. And again, I'm not interested in it. I have found friendship, my friendships to be rife with attachment, expectation, disappointment. A lot of mind reading, a lot of mind reading. Mind reading has been the most troublesome defect for me in and out of sobriety. It's because uh, I think I know what people are thinking. And um, my wife said to me once, you're not a mind reader, you're barely a mind user. <laughs> I think I had finished like her last 15 sentences for her, and she said, you know what, I'm going to take a crack at a complete sentence by myself, and if I run into trouble, I'll let you know, and you can just dive in. <laughs> and by the way, in my mind reading, which is always connected, or usually connected to people-pleasing, because I want you to like me, and then I, there's, they're, they're very friendly, <laughs> mind reading and people-pleasing. Um, you're never thinking anything good about me. I mean, when I'm mind reading, you're very rarely thinking, wow, ah, you're a hell of a guy. You're always thinking, you know, you're a waste of time, man. And we're recalling your protoplasm. <clears throat> um, my alcoholism has not gone below the horizon in 22 years. It has stayed above the horizon as a real piece of business for 22 years. And the reason why is I've become connected to you through the rest of the work and the traditions, so connected to you that my alcoholism has been buoyed by, on, on the heads and shoulders of three million plus members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And here's the miracle, 
it's, uh, it, it stays above the horizon even when I'm not focusing on it, even when I'm not looking at it. It happens in the middle of the night, in between breaths, in between the lines. It happens while I'm moving through this landscape of this life I've been gifted with. That's, that's extraordinary. That is really extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> so my experience of step one, um, to be rid of this self, uh, to admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, that my life is unmanageable, again, I took on a very primitive level at first, and my, ex- my experience of step one is that if it's nourished by the rest of the work, um, it's going to become a big, robust part of my life. And if it's not nourished by the rest of the work, eventually I will drink. I can't stay sober on my own uh, bottom. I can't. I stay sober on your bottom. That's a terrible-sounding sentence. I, I, uh, <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, no, boy, uh, um, I, I stay sober because I'm, I've been listened to, and uh, I've, been, I've tried to pass that, uh, that gift on, and I listen to an incredible amount of misery. And if I don't stay spiritually fit, I will not listen to that misery. I will give you tough love, which to me, more often than not, just means impatience. I mean, I need the scalpel of truth, but I personally need it with the anesthetic of love. <clears throat> I, need, I need to trust where it's coming from. And, um, um, and I know after a while that if I just, if I stop being spiritually healthy, if I stop enjoying the gift of your misery, then eventually I'm just going to want to say, shut up and do this. Just shut up and do it, you know? Um, that being said, I, I work with some guys that if I died on the phone with them, they would talk to the coroner when, when they showed up to pick me up. I, I mean, I sponsor some guys that if they say, how are you? And I said, well, my, my wife's on fire and running around the room screaming. They go, oh, okay, well, I've I got a transmission problem, and my girlfriend's got a transmission problem. And, uh, um, <laughs> uh, and, and that's okay. And eventually, um, because when guys ask me to sponsor them, and I, if I say yes, I, I just tell them that, my deal is, is I'm, I, I'd be more than happy to walk towards uh, God with you and, and, and do the work. And if you don't do the work, eventually I'm not going to be a particularly interesting person to be around. It's pretty much what I do. It's all I got. I, I mean, I could talk to you about politics and art, but I have other people in my life I discuss that with. My friend Brent's here from Oklahoma. He's my, my sponsor, the guy, and he's also a dear friend of mine. We're very fortunate. That's not required. I'm not friend. I don't. I sponsor guys I don't like. <laughs> um, so what? You know, it, it, it's not necessary. It's it, quite often a, a, a lovely, lovely byproduct. I've come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. By the way, one thing I want to ask you a little help. When we take a break, I'm going to be, um, and we might want to put this basket in the back if people want some anonymity. But I've talked. If I've talked about something you'd like me to expand on, or or some stuff you'd like me to make sure I talk about, just write a note and drop it in there. And I promise to not make fun of you. I've been at Q&A meetings sometimes where it's kind of, you know, sometimes the questioner will kind of get ragged for the question. I promise I won't do that. Um, uh, Because the reason being is that in the little break, I'm desperately trying to come up with something to talk about when we come back. So I I have to... (laughs) Brent's laughing because he knows it's true, but um, I, <laughs> uh, so please leave me alone because I, I got to come up with something. I, I'll talk to you after the deal, but if, you have, if there's something you want me to expand on or clarify, please, please let me know. I've come to believe that a power greater than myself can rest, could restore me to sanity. Could, not would, not should. Now, my, my goal here is to, is to be connected to you. My goal is to be part of the connective tissue of Alcoholics Anonymous that buoys on the heads and shoulders of three million members of AA, my alcoholism, your alcoholism. It becomes a shared experience. When I do AA better than you, you know, it's an interesting thing. I I, I don't know if you've seen this. There's a group in Washington that's getting a lot of press right now. 
and it's uh, you know AA's gotten uh, there, there's websites anti AA websites. My favorite is the one that that's Bill Wilson with satanic flames around him. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. That's a goodie. I I, I like to see what's in that guy's sock draw. Um, at any rate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, whether or not it's true it, it, it is, a, is a whole other thing, a whole other thing. And, and if, you, if anybody wants to talk about that, I'm more than happy to. I've had uh, some experience with that group over a period of time. The, the, the thing, and the, you know, AA has gotten that kind of press. It's the first time I've seen a group get that kind of press. It's really interesting. The thing I do know is that once I start to separate myself in any way, bad things happen. Once I start to do it with my sons, once I start to do it in my home life, bad things happen. And usually it's born of me making my suffering precious. Now in the prayer that, I, by the way, this prayer came from me taking, it's not originated by me, I just took notes. This came out of a, a talk my sponsor had with me over the phone, and I just took the notes now. And it's been a huge help to me. This stuff, I've, I've weighed over 300 pounds in sobriety. I've, uh, I've got a life-threatening illness. I've got a couple of them. Um, uh, my sons have had lots of adventures. I've had a lot of money. I've had no money. These are all life circumstances. They all change, you know. Um, oh, I am fine. A lot of good and bad things happen to me, but I am fine. The big I. The eye that you guys see in, in when I come to a meeting and you don't worry about what jewelry I'm wearing or what the hell's going on. The big eye. The big, the big spiritual democracy of Alcoholics Anonymous that has unlimited oxygen. And the minute I start separating, I start sucking the air out of the room. And the minute I start putting quantities and hoops you got to jump through and raising the bar and things that you've got to do if you really want the real deal here then it starts getting very small and, um, and it starts really resembling the life that I had before that I made, uh, I made the big surrender here. You know? um, and what does that have to do with sobriety, this other stuff that I suffered from? Absolutely nothing unless you're going through it. Absolutely nothing. You know, one of the other really bad ideas that the, uh, was at my whole home group was, well, you cheat on your wife, you weigh 600 pounds, you gamble, but it's okay, we're sober. Well, if I'm filled with self-loathing and I'm filled with remorse and my view of the world is, is colored by these defects that, I'm just, that have gone below the horizon and are a complaint, they're not a real piece of business because when it's a real piece of business, I act on it. When it's a real piece of business, you know, m part of my frustration as a father has been when my, I don't think my sons are treating something like a real piece of business. In the handout I gave you, um, there's a wonderful piece. I'd like to read it now. It's in the page after that prayer. And it was written by Dr. Paul, the guy who wrote Dr. Alcoholic Addict. <clears throat> it's one of the last things that he wrote before he, dis he uh, took his light into another room. <clears throat> Be an interested observer. Have you ever watched the continuing deterioration of someone that you really want to help? perhaps a close friend or relative, maybe one or more of your own children, and they do not respond to anything you say or do. This can be an extremely frustrating and discouraging, and discouraging for people in recovery. You want so badly to help, but you can't. They just don't hear you. They do not respond to unsolicited advice or counsel. This happens to me when I try too hard in sponsoring, when I'm working harder on their recovery than they are. It happens to people who have heard about the highly directive, dictatorial type of sponsor and want to be like that but discover that the sponsee simply ignores them. In a situation like this, I assume the role of interested observer. Rather than becoming annoyed at them and at sponsorship in general, I become an interested but inactive observer. I listen. I'm interested in what they're doing and how it is going to turn out. And I answer an occasional question, but mainly I observe. I see myself as sitting quietly in the audience rather than projected into action on the screen. Since I have no investment in the outcome, I'm not emotionally involved in making it come out my way. As a result, I'm comfortable and entertained, rather than frustrated and resentful. I, uh, indeed, I am practicing the AA principle, love and tolerance of others is our code. 
And one more time, I realize that if I want to change my feelings, I must first change my actions and my thinking, mine, not theirs. I can't let their behavior be more important to me than my emotional sobriety, my serenity. No matter how much I love them, no matter how much I care about them, no matter how important their welfare is to me, I must watch my priorities, I must value my serenity ahead of their behavior. Our older son, our son Micah, when uh, he graduated high school, he, uh, instead of going to college, he went to Chiapas, Mexico to work with the Zabatista revolutionaries for a while. And um, it was just really one of the most terrifying things I've ever experienced. And uh, like his politics or not, you might like his politics, you might not, but um, he put his money where his mouth was. In the 60s, I talked a lot of long crap and never got out of the kitchen, you know. But I had a lot of moral and philosophical convictions galore, although I could not act on them. And he was a member of something called the Peace Camps. It was an installation of Westerners who lived in indigenous villages to make sure the Mexican military stopped killing Indians. So the Mexican military would drive by a couple of times a day and stare at him and drive away. The Mexican military is depicted as such a caring, loving group of people. Um, that uh, the, the uh, and my sponsor said, why don't you, when you do the third step in the morning, why don't you give God the Mexican military? So I started saying this prayer. I said, Pop, take the Mexican military. I'm, it's not going to be able to handle that big an organization this morning. <laughs> and, um, and I was sponsored by Paul at that time. And, uh, and one morning, it just didn't work. You know, I just, the waves of fear, and I had this, like, bad Oliver Stone film in my head about what could possibly happen to him. And it wasn't something I trumped up. And my sponsor, you know, the book says, don't argue with a drunk. And he didn't argue with me. He didn't say, he could have said a lot of really stupid things to me. Like, he's not really in danger. You know. (laughs) Um, And what he did was, he said something so gorgeous to me. He said... What if this is the greatest thing he ever does? Now, I would have denied him that. And I don't know if it's the greatest thing he'll ever do, but it sure was quite something. And he came back from that fully cut cloth, a grown citizen. And um, right after he came back, he started examining the opportunity to go to undergraduate school, which, as you can imagine, his mother and I were very, very excited about. And he wasn't apparently not filling out the papers fast enough and would possibly miss some deadlines. So his mother was getting a little nervous, and we were starting to kind of lean on him to get this stuff done. And as Nancy was sort of badgering him about it, he looked at, he was 18 at this time, he looked up at her and said, uh, and I quote, do you actually believe that your anxiety benefits me in any way? (laughs) 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 And and I thought, uh, we were kind of hoping it would. Uh, to tell you the truth. And the interesting one... <laughs> um, but if you know my son, it's an easy thing to believe. I'll just tell you one other quickie about him. When he was a little boy, I was sober two years. He was ten year, uh, eight years old. And I was making the boy's lunch. And um, I said to Michael, what do you want in your hot dog? And he said, I want mustard, onions, and lettuce. And he was eight. And I said, lettuce? He said, oh, okay, I don't want lettuce. And he walked away from me, and he came back about an hour later and looked at me directly in the eye, and I'm not altering one syllable. He said to me, I will never again allow your opinion of what I want affect what I ask for. So I asked him to sponsor me. (laughs) What the hell is that, you know? But what Micah said in that moment about those um, about filling out that stuff, do you actually think that your anxiety benefits me in any way, is a, is a big, big lesson for me. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, in a sense you said to me, and my sponsor wanted to know what my dreams were, but basically said to me, what do you want? What do you want to do? And I had stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to write well. I wanted to have an interesting romantic life. I wanted a bunch of stuff. And then you basically said to me, You can work towards that. I wouldn't be surprised if you achieved that. But let me ask you a question. Do you have to be miserable until you get it? To which my reply would have been, oh, yeah. Uh, 
if I'm not miserable about it, who the hell is going to be miserable about it? And if I'm not miserable about it, how is it going to get done? Now, the crazy idea there is that somehow I think that my suffering is going to purchase the thing I crave. What a great design for living. <laughs> Get miserable enough for some, about something, and odds are it's going to happen. But you've got to stay miserable, because if you don't stay on duty, the whole thing's going to go down the crapper. <laughs> It's a complete refutation of all of, of our whole idea, which is this is going to happen even when I'm not focusing on it. If I trust you, if I take these seemingly disconnected, unrelated actions. Now, an important piece of that for me is I believe that faith without works is dead. And I also believe that works without faith are dead. I believe that I, if, if I uh, have faith and it's not supported by action, that the faith will eventually wither without demonstration and without communication with you because the demonstration leads me into communication with you. I also believe that if it's all about action and it's not tethered to some spiritual experience, that eventually it's just going to become a lot of running around, a lot of activity, not action. And it's, if it's not tethered to a spiritual pursuit, now it can't be every day. Some days I'm just showing up and doing my job, just putting fenders on Chevys, you know, just showing up and getting it done. But at the end of the day, if at the, in the middle of the night, and it says it's the last paragraph of chapter three as we move into our, our discussion of, of step three, that the time and place will come where it'll be three o'clock in the morning, my mouth will flow, flood with saliva, the room will spin, and I'll be drunk, and I won't drink. I won't drink. Who would have thunk it? Who would have even thunk that that would even be possible? Because nothing stops me from drinking. Not my baby boys, not a woman who loved me, not nothing. If you get in between me and the drink, you vanish. You become something less than human or you disappear. You become paper mache or you don't exist. And it happens over and over again without explanation, without reason. It stops presenting itself as a real piece of business. And you can start seeing it later in sobriety. If, if, if action isn't taken to keep this thing robust, you can start seeing it flatten out. You know, it starts falling apart in my hands. Um, that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, not would and not should, but that, that it's possible. There are two wonderful lists in our book. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. On, on page 17, on the bottom paragraph, it talks about the spiritual democracy of Alcoholics Anonymous. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and a harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. Where in there does it say, if you're part of this group, you're getting the real deal? You're hearing stuff at this group you don't hear at other groups. You know, mainstream AA, well, if you want to take a chance out there, go ahead. But if I were you, I would just attend meetings that we have because we're just a little, we're, we got to, you know, a take. We know works. I don't know about that other stuff. Um, I believe in the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. And it says that, you know, uh, each group is autonomous except when it, com it comes to, you know, unless their actions affect other groups or AA as a whole. I believe the spirit of that is if I say I'm doing AA better than you, then I am affecting AA as a whole. I think that's part of what happened to that group that got written up in Newsweek. Ugh. <clears throat> um, does that mean I can't love my group? Does that mean I can't get excited about it and take pleasure in the methodology or the uniqueness of my group? And of course not. That's the fun, you know? I just had a, a ended. A, I, I do this workshop in my home. Uh, it's not an AA meeting. There's no democracy, no rotation. There's nothing. I just do some stuff that me and the guys I sponsor get interested in. We'll, we'll do some uh, non-approved AA literature. We went through the Sermon in the Mount together. We, we went through Not God, which is my favorite history of AA by far. And it's non-conference approved literature. Uh, it's written by a guy named Ernest Kurtz, and it's fantastic. One of the things he does is he explains a few things that aren't explained in our literature. You know the, the guy in the tradition, in Tradition 3, there's a guy who shows up in an AA group and was suffering from like some real bad stuff and they didn't know what to do about the guy? 
I've always wondered, what the hell was wrong with that guy? Well, Kurtz talks about it. And what he was was, and this is like in the late 30s, early 40s, guy shows up at one of the few AA clubhouses in the world. It was in New York. It was a gay, African-American, heroin-addicted ex-con. They must have been looking for this guy's spaceship. I mean, this is so outside of, the, of their personal experience, and they didn't want to let him in, and they called Bill down, and they went, and Bill said, what are you talking about? How do you get to do that? How do you get to kill him? Just shoot him. Just, just kill him now, you know. Um, at any rate, um, uh, step two. <clears throat> there are two wonderful lists in our book. One is a list of things people say about us. It's on page 20, the third paragraph. How many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone, why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine, lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl, I think I, I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But, but there he is all lit up again. Now these commonplace observations in, uh, on drink, drinkers, which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different than ours. It's a, a, a terrible thing in our culture. Um, because of our problem mainly rests in our mind, alcoholism still gets trivialized in a way that's just absolutely crazy. You know, uh, millions of people, sufferers, hundreds of thousands of people de dying on a daily basis. Of course, it's at very few times does it say alcoholism on the death certificate. It says stabbed to death with rusty scissors in the middle of the night. You know, it says a lot of stuff, but very rarely um, does it say alcoholism. And then there's the, uh, the, the list of stuff that we say about ourselves on page 24, uh, the third paragraph. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how, or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way and after the third or fourth drink pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Uh, or only to have that thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink. And my personal favorite, what's the use anyhow? And if you pause and take a look at the friends and family of alcoholics and people who uh, have been deeply affected and ravaged by alcoholism, who don't have the allergy but are, are members of friends and family, I think you can see that how this list it becomes hardwired into their thinking. What's the use anyhow? And when you're trying to be pretty enough or smart enough or good enough so the sleeper will awake, because you know, and trying to impact, uh, you know, I'll stop after the sixth compliment or whatever, however that manifests. But you can, it's very clear to see how this kind of thinking becomes, this kind of insanity becomes hardwired into the, um, uh, the thoughts and feelings and actions of friends and, and family of alcoholics. When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he's probably placed himself beyond human aid and unless locked up may die or go permanently insane. So it says if you, if you have the physical allergy, if you're someone with alcoholic tendencies, and this kind of thinking becomes well established in you, you're dead. Pretty much, you're probably dead. By the way, they're very nice to us in the book. They're very kind to us. Um, uh, they're not so nice in the, in the chapters that are not written to us. The chapter to the family afterward, chapter to the employer, chapter to the wives. They, they're not quite as polite, you know. My favorite line I, there's two of my favorite lines is um in the big book is uh <laughs> on um on page 63 and 64 it's the last uh sentence on 63 and the first on 64 it says that we start out on a personal house cleaning which many of us had never attempted i think they're just so kind i've never shown a guy how to do an inventory and i had him say Wow, I, I've been doing that for years. I can't believe you guys do that. That's, that's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. Um, um, but I'll just share with you what used to be my favorite line in the big book of AA. And if you're new here, it could be your favorite line too if you want it to be. 
It starts on the bottom of 65 and continues on 66. And they're assuming that you've written a list of how you have been screwed. You've written a list of people who ha- and people, institutions, and principles that are just against you. You know, they're just against you, you know. And it says, if you're looking at this, it says, the first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. Well, that's enough for today. We really don't need to go any further than that. I think it's time to go to sleep. I, I just used to read that sentence and just get tickled all over. Because don't read the next page. <laughs> Because what the next page says is you're right and you're dead. Because we're not saying don't argue with a drunk. We're not saying that you haven't been screwed. You've got the list. You've apparently been screwed, okay? You experience this in a way that is so injurious that it it eclipses every good thing that happens in your life. You experience the the fancied or real wrongdoing of others in a way that is so intrusive that it actually eclipses every possible chance you have for success, connection, connectivity, feeling part of, feeling connected to you, this crazy idea that I can live separated from you or separated from some of you, you know. Um, I was brought up in, in a Jewish home. Um, I am not Christian. Uh, I use the teachings of Jesus a, a ton. Um, and uh, a lot of the Jesus Christ message, look, you can use any sentence from the Bible, the big book, the Koran, or the Torah to, use, to prove any point you want. We, we all know that. You can use spiritual tools as spiritual weapons very, very easily. And the nightmare, the big nightmare, the nightmare that we see around us that unfortunately people are being gobbled up with and we can see in Alcoholics Anonymous is this idea of separation, this idea that I have the way, the application. And what the mystics say, what the Christ message is, as far as I understand it, is that the thorns and the flowers both get water. And if I start deciding when one doesn't and one does, I'm going to die. I'm not going to kill the thorns or the flowers. They're going to find a way to get through somehow. I am going to die. Uh, it's a wonderful quote, none of them by me, on the first page of this handout. And I love it so much. It's the, um, it's the second from the bottom. And it says, God does not die on the day that we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. Strangely enough, that's a quote from Dag Hammarskjöld, who used to be the Secretary General of the UN many, many years ago. I'm 55. I know that my life is ostensibly over, but I am 55, and... (laughs) I, um, <laughs> it's a silly age for such a young boy. I'm going to read it again. God does not die on the day that we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance, the steady radiance, uh, renewed daily. Uh, I'm sorry, die on the day, steady radiance, renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. And when I start deciding who gets the water and who doesn't, um, I'm, I'm a dead man. Our book says that I cannot be helpful to all people, but I must at least take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Sometimes the opposite of resentment is not always peace, freedom, and love. It can be the absence of murder. Um, uh, um, There's plenty of people I don't like. I don't have to like them, but I must at least take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. There is stuff that's not excusable, but it all has to be forgivable. I'm going to talk about forgiveness more. I want to end uh, our first session um, with the, uh, uh, the last sentence on that first page of the handout. It is, to me, the most, one of the most beautiful expressions of step two that I've ever heard. It's a definition of faith. Now, this definition of faith was made by a spiritual teacher. Who's <laughs> he says that he used to confuse faith and belief. And for him, they're different. And I don't want to get into semantics. It's kind of interesting. It's like when... Does faith become belief? You know, in my home group, they used to say something that, you know, a lot of people say, which is, you know, make your higher power anything you want. 
And they used to tell a story about this woman who made her higher power the tree outside of her house. And she prayed to the tree every morning. She stayed sober. And one morning, um, a city truck was uh, feeding the last branch of the tree into a chipping machine. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> that was great. Oh, I love you. That was great. Um, and she went running down the street after the truck, screaming, Oh, God, save my tree. So she stepped to the shore. <laughs> she had to make a transition because her tree had been sent through a John Deere mulching blade, and um, she, had to, she had to make it. So he talks about his beliefs are different from faith because he likes his beliefs because he believes in them. And the stuff that he believes in really feels good. Faith is the willingness to expose myself to the truth despite the consequences. I never heard a better expression of step two. A step into thin air. Do you believe that a power greater than yourself can restore your sanity? Not that it would, not that it should. It says in chapter four that if you are even willing to believe in the possibility, possible existence of a power greater than yourself, we emphatically assure you that you're on your way. So... Um, I want to end our first session on that note. On step two, we'll charge into step three after about five minutes. I, I leave it to the drunk wranglers to get everybody back in here in about five minutes. Anyway, right, that last little thing I read, uh, faith, the willingness to expose myself to the truth despite the consequences, to me is one of the great expressions of my experience of step two, my initial experience of step two, uh, which was a step off into thin air, uh, an act of blind uh, faith. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is I just, uh, I was out of plans. I was just out of plans. I love newcomer plans. <laughs> One of my favorites. This guy, <laughs> this buddy of mine in the Midwest was sponsoring this guy for a while. And um, he uh, stopped doing the work and drank, sober about seven years, and got about three DUIs in rapid succession. And I don't know how he stayed out of jail. I mean, they, with three DUIs, they, uh, in rapid succession, um, but he, uh, and, and he came up with a plan. This was his plan. He made uh, five Molotov cocktails. This is a little town in the Midwest. And his plan was to blow up the courthouse, thereby they would lose his paperwork. <laughs> Does anyone even have paperwork? I don't even think there is paperwork anymore. So he made the five <laughs> Molotov cocktails. He put one in each corner of the building and took the fifth one and laid down in his car and fell asleep. Now, I've never read the instructions on a Molotov cocktail, but I believe throwing is involved at some point. I think at some point you've got to throw the thing. Now, you know, these days, if you try to bomb a government installation, then they don't give you a court card. You don't go to the 30 AA meetings. You wind up in Guantanamo Bay with a black bag over your head for a period of time. So he's... Uh... <laughs> And uh, I was out of plans, and I was willing. When my sponsor said, are you an alcoholic, I said yes. In whatever way I understood that. He said, is your life unmanageable around alcohol? Now, I'm a guy who one time when I had a toothache, I thought, okay, I, I'll take a, a big darning needle and with a pair of pliers, and I'll heat it up over the stove and push it into my gum. You already... I mean, you're off, okay? Um, and that'll relieve some of the pressure. These are the ideas I'm having, you know? Plus, I'm bad with objects. I'm disoriented. I'm disconnected from my surroundings. I still am. I, uh, anytime I deal with objects, my sons kind of just go, watch, watch. <laughs> um, I was trying to fix their phone, and I had their phone in my hand and my phone in my hand, and... Uh, I called my phone with their phone, and my phone rang, and I said, uh, who the hell is calling me? I'm trying to... And, and I wasn't kidding around, you know, and they just go... Um, 
<laughs> we were skiing, and um, it, it snowed about a foot while we were in the lodge that night. And in the morning, Jesse starts sweeping off the top of the car. And I said, son, you don't need to do that. We, I have a sunroof. And, and they start going, what? And I thought somewhere in my Looney Tune brain that if I retracted the sunroof, it would just bring the snow with it. So I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I retract the sunroof, and the car fills with snow, with like 10 cubic feet of snow. And it, it's getting worse. I'll tell you why. I've admitted this to Brent already, but I um, recently, in the last six months, sometimes I go to work at about 5 a.m. and I need to load the car up with stuff. And, you know, you get into a rhythm, you know, to get out. I get all the stuff in the car. I get in the car to drive away, and I think, man, everything seems so far away. I had gotten into the back seat of the car, (laughs) and I had closed the door. And the first thing I thought was, no one must ever know of this. <laughs> I, I really have some severe problems. I have some severe emotional, mental, and spiritual problems. And um, at any rate, <clears throat> I have come to believe, uh, when my sponsor said, is your life unmanageable? I said, yes, although I didn't know the gravity of the problem at all, believe me. And... Um, And then he said, have you come to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity? And I said, no. And he said, do you believe that it's possible? It says in the the third page of our our fourth chapter um, that none of us can fully comprehend or define that power, which is God. And then on the page right after, it says that if you are willing to admit that it's possible, even the possibility, talk about a, a huge hoop to jump through. And I said, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. Now, I want to tell you, some years before that, I would not have said it was possible. I was a staunch atheist. I would have laughed at it. By the way, he doesn't bother me. He might bother some other people, but he doesn't bug me at all. It's the sound of families that shouldn't be together, as far as I'm concerned. um, I can't wear pants like that. I just look silly. Uh, (laughs) Um... There are none in my draw either, I swear to God. <clears throat> um, have you come to believe that a power greater than yourself could restore your sanity? Yes, I did. These, and he said, good, let's go. Let's move. He didn't ask me to qualify it. He didn't ask how much do you believe it. He didn't ask any of that. Because my experience of one, two, and three, how could I really comprehend how unmanageable my life was? Really comprehend it without an inventory, without seeing it. How could I really d- appreciate the responsibility that this gave me without eight and nine. If I do the rest of the work, it will nourish and make my experience of the first three steps deeper and wider and broader. And the more I disconnect that as I move deeper into sobriety, my experience of the first three steps will become attenuated. They will become starved. They will become anorexic. They will stop eating. And I will drink. My alcoholism will go below the horizon. It will stop presenting as a real piece of business. Because what is going to, you know, what is going to uh, uh, enliven my appreciation that this is a real piece of business, the more that I appreciate that my life's unmanageable. Not that I'm an, an incompetent idiot, although that comes up. You know, when you get into the backseat of your car to drive away, it occurs to you. But what I appreciate is is that I'm not going to be the captain of this, that the secret to my success is to become more involved with you, more connected to you, not as a people pleaser, not to ingratiate you, not with a lot of noise. Sometimes it's being able to sit absolutely quiet with you with a hand on your shoulder and be part of the big laughing love that is Alcoholics Anonymous. And anybody who tries to present this to me as dutiful misery, I have no use for you. I don't. This idea, that's an old idea for me, that life is falling from the womb and crawling across hostile territory to the grave. (laughs) It's an old idea, and it's an idea that I had. Um, God is either everything or nothing. So these admissions take me to step three, and they take me to the fifth chapter. <clears throat> B 
Beautiful, beautiful step three. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. The, 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 uh, the engine, the mechanism, of, co- of course, is to immediately start turning my eyes out. I'm asking for the removal of my difficulties so I can bear witness to a fellow sufferer. As far as I know, Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing to do with, with cured people administering to the troubled. As far as I understand Alcoholics Anonymous, these are, uh, it's about fellow sufferers. One of the things that was so hard for me when I was new is sometimes I'd hear people come in and say, you know, I had a baby and uh, that baby will never have to see me drunk. And, man, it just used to kill me because my kids had seen me drunk and I had injured them terribly. Their backs were broken by alcoholism by the time I got in here. And um, I didn't get it. I didn't understand that we were just going to have two different kinds of demonstrations. Number one, I also didn't know at that time that um, just because you're sober doesn't mean you're going to be a good parent. I've seen some of the worst parenting I've ever seen in my life in Alcoholics Anonymous or in the world. Uh, with non-alcoholics, just because you don't you know, drink doesn't mean you're going to be a great parent, you know. I've already read the toddler property laws. Um, um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, what I didn't know is that I was, uh, when I asked God to remove my difficulties in the third step, when I drew close to him and he revealed himself to me, um, that I was going to be able to talk about how troubled my children were and how I got sober and the family recovery that we had. That when my kids came in and they couldn't stop grinding their teeth and they had tics and they were cut out from the society of other children, that as I got re- involved with you, as I became connected with you, as I started to blow on the embers of the connective tissue of Alcoholics Anonymous, now sometimes the kids get well and sometimes they don't. The thing that I do know is they're going to have a sober parent that's going to try to be more helpful with their illness. That I know. That's the only thing I can commit to you that I'll try to do. It happens that in our house the the children really recovered. Um, And neither one of them um, has the allergy. They've had a lot of adventures. But at the end of the day, folks, you either have the allergy or you don't. I mean, it's really as simple as that. You can be as nutty as you want, you know. You can have as many other, you know, there are a lot of problems that have nothing to do with alcoholism. You know, I've divested myself of this notion that that, uh, that the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous can take care of everything. And it can't cure tuberculosis. You know, it can't cure certain mental disease, you know. Um, there's some guys in my home group I just like to carry a bag a sock full of Valium around and whack them in the back of the head with it. It's just uh, put a Zoloff lick out on their table at a meeting. But um, there's, <laughs> there's, there's real mental disease that has, you know, nothing to do. I, I mean, granted, when I straighten out spiritually, I will straighten out mentally and physically. That certainly has happened for me, and I've seen it happen to me personally. I've seen it happen to thousands of people. <clears throat> so on the bottom of 62... Um, and we've read most of 62 in conjunction with the first two steps. This is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. First of all, I had to quit playing God. How do I quit playing God and boss you around and tell you who to date and what to do and what to eat and where to go? And how, do I, how does that exist? That's sort of like Clark Kent and Superman. You don't quite ever see him in the same place at the same time. How do I make all the decisions for you in your life and boss you around and exclude you from my love if you don't do it my way and not play God? How does that happen? How do you do an end run around that? I've heard two great descriptions of alcoholic thinking. Unfortunately, one of them was about the Nazi mind, which is really a drag, and one was about a mass murderer. (laughs) <laughs> and I'll share them both with you. Um, <laughs> I've heard the Nazi mind described as the most perfectly tuned clock that keeps the most precise time in the universe for one minute and then skips a century. That when it works, it's rhapsodic, it's perfect. And when it doesn't, it leaves gaps large enough to move an entire culture through. I have experienced this in Alcoholics Anonymous, that there are just these gaps. It's kind of a logic no-fly zone. Uh, that I'm not going to play God, but I'm going to 
make some rules here. I'm going to, rather than being an interested, loving observer, I'm going to be a psychotic participant. <laughs> and then the second unfortunate description of alcoholism was about Ted Bundy. Um, but it was a great quote. Um, Bundy was a law student. If you're not familiar with him, he did a lot of bad stuff and killed a lot of people. And um, he used to represent himself in court. And apparently he was brilliant. And a group of the shrinks and cops that were that knew what this guy did, they intimately knew what this guy did and had been trying to get him for a long time, they're sitting around and they're talking about him in one of his trials. And one of them said, it's making me sick, but I'm starting to root for him. <laughs> With all the information that this guy had, he was starting to empathize with the guy and root for him. In the, and and um, one of the shrinks said something that blew me out of my chair. He said, don't you understand that when he is in that court, the only thing that is palpable to him is his own agony? And I said, what an incredible description of alcoholism. How was I able to do a lot of this stuff? My self-centeredness and selfishness was so powerful that it actually, the only thing that was real to me was not its impact on you, not your suffering, not how was I able to do a lot of this stuff. My self-centeredness and selfishness was so powerful that it actually, the only thing that was real to me was not its impact on you, not your suffering, not how I presented in the world, not what was going to happen to my children, but my own suffering was the only thing that was real to me. I don't believe in thieving. I don't believe in lying. But you know what? I'm a survivor. <laughs> and um, it's not pretty. The first thing I have to do is quit playing God. Now, part of the complication here as a sponsor and as a member of AA and as a, a, a personal, so, as somebody who personally needs to experience step three in order to survive, there's also a line between being playing God and being irresponsible. It's a slippery slope. It's an interesting thing. You know, when a guy calls me and reports to me that his brother-in-law's kind of pissed him off and he thinks really the best thing for him to do is, you know, to get out in the middle of the night and, you know, and, and cut the guy's um, brake lines, you know, on his, all his vehicles so that he dies in a flaming car crash. To not play God, to really not play God, I would just say, okay, fine, you know, maybe, you know, after you kill me, you'll write a resentment against yourself or something. <laughs> or I can, I, I can insinuate myself into the process in a, in a loving way. The, there's a difference between being irresponsible and playing God and, and walking that line and taking a look at it. I, at this point, at 22 years of sobriety, I have erred on the side of not playing God a lot. I really have. I am trying to, to find a way to be responsible in a way, in a loving way. Um, guy called me one night, he was going to kill himself, and I acted responsibly. I did what the, um, what the citizens do. I called the police. That's what citizens do. I don't, I don't, you know, I want to kill myself. Well, you know, call me when you're serious about this thing. Click. I called the cops. I go over there, and the cop said, we just think he's had too much to drink. And I go, oh, really? <laughs> I go in, he stands up. The whole time he's talking to the cops, he's sitting, he's sitting on a butcher knife. The entire time, you know? So I, I, you know, I didn't err on the side of not playing God. I, I took that kind of action. Um, uh, one of the things I, I love, and I've heard this in newcomers so many times, is, you know, a new guy will say, you know what, I was with some people smoking crack last night, and I really felt comfortable. You know, it wasn't hard for me. <laughs> and part of the insane thing there is we forget it's illegal. You know, I'm really glad you're comfortable. You know, when, when, <laughs> when Jonah got out of the belly of the whale, he didn't go back in to get his hat. You know, there, there's like, there's, <laughs> there's a, a line of irresponsibility <laughs> there. We had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. And it talks about um, that I'm going, to I'm going to get close to him. I'm going to perform his, his, his work well. I got on my knees with my sponsor. We said this prayer together, which I felt was embarrassing and unnecessary, but we did it. 
I thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could abandon our, at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. I don't know what that meant. I didn't go out and buy a robe, you know, but I just did it as good as I could do it at that time. And I want to share with you something because it took me a long time to get this and figure it out, but it was just another gorgeous thing my beautiful sponsor did for me. I had a guy named Don M. was my first sponsor for my first 10 years. Um, we got on our knees and we said this prayer and he opened his book and we both held hands and we read the prayer from the book. And part of my twisted noodle, part of my brain said, boy, shouldn't you like know this? You know, you've been doing this a long time. I've asked, you know, I'm soliciting your aid here. I think you should know this prayer. Of course he knew the prayer. He didn't want to separate himself from me. He didn't want to be more sober than me. He didn't want to sit there and close his eyes and know it by heart why I had to read it. And he read it with me. What a, what a, <laughs> what a great, loving, generous thing. And he didn't say it to me. You know, I, it didn't take me long. About eight years later, I, re- <laughs> I realized it, you know. Um, but in that time, monkey see, monkey do, I had always held hands and read it with the guy. That I was gonna, that I was doing it with, the generosity in Alcoholics Anonymous. Next, we launched. You know, it, it, it says here. You know, it's a funny thing. Um, I had this spiritual sickness, and the uh, only way to get out of it, uh, the only way to get out of this terrible fix I'm in, is some kind of spiritual experience. And in the Big Book of AA. There's just, it's like an internal combustion engine all throughout the book. You know, in step five, it says, uh, in step three, it says sometimes a, a great effect is felt at once. You know, um, at the end of step four, at uh, the end of chapter five, it says, and we've, uh, you know, shoot off and swallowed some big chunks of truth about ourselves. In step five, it says, now we really begin to have a real spiritual experience. You know, in the middle of nine, it, it says that we have you know, a new peace, a new freedom. We know freedom from fear of financial insecurity. This was written in 1937 to 1939 during global economic collapse. If there had been a PR department working with these guys, they would not have let them put that you will know freedom from fear of financial insecurity. That's the last thing they would have said. Guys, promise them anything. Promise them. Do not promise them that. That's crazy. Nobody can do that in this world that we're living in. They promised it and they delivered it. And then in, in, in step 10, it says that we'll, the alcohol problem will be removed. Um, we'll we'll uh, know the correct use of self-will. We won't even be swearing off. The problem will be removed. In 11, it says the occasional hunter inspiration will actually become a working part of the mind. And in 12, I have had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, and now I'm going to go talk to other people. You know, I was in psychotherapy for 18 years by the time I got to AA. I was going to be dead, but I was going to understand it. <laughs> And I got no beef against therapy. I'm in therapy now. I get a tremendous amount of, uh, out of therapy. I really like it. Um, I don't use it to treat my alcoholism. It's, a, it's like showing up at a gunfight with a knife. It's just a, a, a humongous mistake. And uh, never once has any of my therapists, especially before I got sober, shown me a solution and then said, go talk to other people. They mostly said, shh, <laughs> try to quiet down a little bit. You might want to talk to less people, actually. And you guys have always said to me, we don't care what you've got. Give it away. Just don't give away anything you don't have. And I've made mistakes. I've given away, tried to give away stuff I don't have. It's not pretty. But you said, if all you got is a, a car and a quarter, lend somebody a dime and give them a ride. You know? So this decision that I've made to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, as I understand him, is a, is a great decision. It's, um, we, next we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which was a personal house cleaning, which many of us never attempted. <laughs> Though the decision was a vital and a crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless it followed at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. There are three sections to the inventory, as is explained in the book. There's a section on resentments that we're asked to write twice on. There's a section on fears we're asked to write once on. And there's a, re- a, a, a section on sex which we're asked to write a story on. The section on sex to me is really become m- more about my life and the way that I want to be in the world, the kind of man that I would be. 
It says in, in the doctor's opinion, Silkworth talks about um, that uh, we long felt that some form of moral psychology was required. And I always wondered what the hell moral psychology is, you know, and I get it now. And um, um, I just got to tell, I'm gonna st- I want to tell you this story because it's a great story. Uh, I have a friend named Bobby, and unfortunately doesn't get asked to talk a lot in AA. He's quite a guy. And he came off Skid Row in uh, L.A., which is a tough place to come off of. He had alcoholic paralysis. And he was going to kill himself. He climbed up to a bridge in Los Angeles and said, Pop, I'm, I'm done. What had happened an hour before is he had gone back to his house with his three daughters and took off his crunchy clothes. His wife let him come in to take a shower. And when he got out of the shower, he heard his five-year-old daughter say to his wife, when are you going to realize that you can't make a daddy out of that creepy man? And he put his filthy clothes on and he walked out and he walked up to a bridge in L.A. and said, just let me know because I got to go. And a wind came up and pushed him back off the bridge and he walked down to a payphone and called AA and he's never had another drink. He's a great guy. And uh, he made this deal with God about his physical health, which was failing, about if he got better, he'd run the marathon in L.A., and he got better. And he went down to sign up for the marathon. He was a couple of years sober, and they had this card. The L.A. Times had people filling out a card to say why he wanted to run the marathon, and he wrote down the reason. And the guys down on Skid Row read the article that was published on him because the marathon runs through Skid Row, and the guys down there put together a cheering section for him when he ran through Bobby came off a place called Harbor Lights, which is a Salvation Army deal down on the nickel in L.A. And they have a thing called the Hall of Miracles, where people who have come off the nickel uh, off Fifth Street and have stayed three years sober, they put them into the Hall of Miracles. They have this lovely little thing. And um, I went down there for his induction into the Hall of Miracles. And one kind of heartbreaking thing is there were no news cameras down there. What a missed opportunity, you know. And there's, there's you. You're there, dressed pretty and smiling and comfortable. All these families and kids running around. And the Salvation Army guy said something about the kids there that just changed. I used to sometimes come into an AA meeting. If there was a kid there, I'd do my traditional snubbing and glowering a little bit, you know, my prejudge. And, um, you know, if a kid's whacking you in the back of the head... <laughs> Through an entire meeting, it's probably not a good idea. But he just was, this guy from the Salvation Army was a tremendous help to me. He said that thing I said before. It's not tend to originate with me. He said today, if the children are difficult or maybe distracting, just remember that it's the music of families that shouldn't be together. And I've just loved that. So I'm sorry that apparently this child's been ejected. But... uh, Resentment's no big deal. It's just the source of all spiritual illness and the great destroyer of alcoholics. (laughs) Don't be alarmed. (laughs) It'll cut you off from the sunlight of the spirit, drag your ass out, and kill you dead, but work a step a year. Relax. (laughs) It's going to kill me. It's going to eat my brain and my heart and turn my life black and throw me out of my own life. There won't be room for me in my own life. Not when I'm re-experiencing my hatred of you. Um, And here's uh, uh, an added uh, um, terror. That somehow, if I don't stay invigorated and having a robust, exciting experience in AA, it starts becoming okay for me to have certain resentments as a sober person. You know? And I try to wish them away. I try to pray them away. And um, and I start having recidivism. I start having the same resentment coming up again and again. I start suffering from the same thing again and again. And I start losing hope. And if I don't start expanding my experience, my spiritual tools, and my way to implement them as a member of AA, I start feeling like I'm on a spiritual hamster wheel. And it starts going below the horizon and stop presenting itself as a real piece of business. And I go mad. And one of the you know guys I sponsor say have asked me, do you still do inventory? And I always say to them, you'll know when I stop. 
I will not be particularly interested in what's going on with you. I will not. I might act it, but you know when you act it, people know. Sometimes when a guy's not so self-obsessed, I mean, <laughs> but he's really not paying attention. But <clears throat> and um, the book is is real clear about about this. I'm resentful at Scott for being a terrible father. It affects my self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, and sex. Um, I uh, again. Please don't take anything I'm saying as an indictment of what you're doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just sharing my stuff, not as an. I'm not sharing at you. I'm sharing with you, and I'm just here to tell you what I do. Um, I, I understand people use the phrase "What was my part?" and I understand that it's very helpful to a lot of people. It's not a phrase that I use. Um, when I'm resentful at Nazis for slaughtering Jews during World War II. What's my part? And no, I don't have a part. I don't see it that way. Again, this can be semantics. Okay, what the, uh, the the phrase my part's not even it's nowhere in the first 164 pages of the big book. Oh, and again, I'm not indicting it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just sharing what I've required to to see this clearly for me. It says, what are the defects in me that if God would remove the resentment would be gone? Right. The first thing that was apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. But again, don't read the next page, because what the next page says is you're right and you're dead. You are dead because you experience this in a way that is so injurious to you, you can't live your life while you're experiencing this thing. You know, I wake up, I think about it. I think about that guy. Um, would everybody join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily spirit, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Do you um, guys use that prayer at your home group at all? Okay, you just said, almost everybody here, I think, just said the prayer. You said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I want you to do a 15-second contemplation right now. Okay, you can close your eyes or keep them open and ask yourself, is there anybody or anything in your life you're not forgiving? Thank you. If there's anybody or anything in your life you're not forgiving, why'd you say the prayer? You just said, forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against us. Why do I keep saying this prayer? I say it at almost every meeting I go to. Now, if you've never read the Sermon on the Mount, um, I just want to tell you that uh, uh, Emmett Fox, the guy who wrote, it's a book called Sermon on the Mount. In the back of the book, there's this really remarkable uh, uh, section on the Lord's Prayer. And he takes uh, each sentence in the Lord's Prayer and writes a chapter about it. And the chapter that he writes about forgiveness is one of the most powerful, life-changing experiences I've ever had. Um, he basically says, Fox says, if you're saying this prayer and you're not forgiving, he says, basically, you should choke on the words. <laughs> he says, and he suggests not saying the prayer until you forgive. Otherwise, why are you saying it? It becomes a very flat, empty pursuit, a hastily mumbled thing. It's not even a prayer. It's the end of the meeting, <laughs> you know? And I don't want to live that way. I, I don't want things to flatten out. I don't want them to be sucked dry of the possible spiritual growth opportunity that's there. So one of the things that Fox says at the end of the chapter on Forgive Us Our Trespasses, he says that one practice that's really helped him is he says that every day, he's, part of his morning deal is he forgives everyone for everything. I forgive everyone for everything. So I started doing it. No, I started trying to do it. <laughs> and what starts happening in my head is I forgive everyone for everything. And my brain goes, him? You're forgiving him? Her? That, that government, the people who are murdering people in Darfur, you're going to forgive them? 
And I started having to deal with this idea of forgiveness. Again, do I excuse the people who are committing genocide in Darfur? No. No. Do I forgive them? If I don't, I'm dead. Does forgiveness mean that I don't take action? No. Does forgiveness mean that I don't give money to, uh, to operations that I hope are victorious? No. It doesn't mean any of that. The Bhagavad Gita is a wonderful, wonderful uh, Hindu tract. And if you've never read it, it's really quite marvelous. And um, there are these, uh, the Bhagavad Gita takes place on a battlefield where two warring factions, most of them relatives. <laughs> um, one of my favorite playwrights, Anton Chekhov, when he was describing what the theater should be, what, what his idea of the theater should be, he said theater should be like eating dinner with your family. Nothing is said during the meal except for past the salt and more butter, please. And yet by dessert, your life is destroyed. <laughs> so there... Uh, <coughs> welcome to my house. And um, so on this battlefield, a god, they don't know he's a god, and this one of the heroes of the battle are talking. And, they're about, and the relatives are about to slaughter people. So it's about life. It's about being on the battle. Uh, go in, and what the message is, what they say is, keep your, uh, keep your brain in the, cloud, in, in, in the fight. Keep your brain in the sponsorship. Keep your brain in the group. Keep your brain at your job. Keep your brain in your marriage. Keep your brain in those relationships. And keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord. You know, what does it say in the chapter to the family afterwards? It says we feel that God wants us to have our head in the clouds and our feet on the ground. You know, and I love that. I love the spirit of that, you know, a lot. Um, so with forgiveness, as I've done this morning, med- that, that morning declaration, it points up to me where I'm not forgiving. It points up to me where I'm re- re-experiencing and... Um, and I'm, you know, I'm denying rain to either the thorns or the flowers. I'm saying love is here. I'm a part of the big spiritual democracy of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I'm not part of that democracy, I'm, I'm pretty much I'm putting myself on an ice flow and I'm eventually going to die. How can I continue to do that? And again, there is behavior that's not excusable, but it's all got to be um, forgivable. I heard in AA, you know, that... Um, my parents didn't do a good job, but it's the best that I, uh, they could do. And you know what? That's fine, but they really did a bad job. I was really injured as a kid. And they did the best they could, but I don't really, I'm not interested in patting them on the back for that. It, they, it's job at times just sucked, you know? And I forgive them absolutely and completely or I'm going to die. It's not excusable, but it is forgivable. Uh, I'm resentful at Nazis for slaughtering Jews during World War II. What are the defects in me that if God would remove, the resentment would be gone? That's what my part. What are the defects? Blue skies. God's got a magic wand. I'm not going to talk about if it's possible for these things to be removed. I don't know. I'm going to tell you what it is in me that if God would remove, the resentment would be gone. Let's go back to father. I'm resentful at Scott for being a lousy father. And I was. No, I did good stuff. And I did a lot of bad stuff. And at the end of the day, the bad far outweighed the good. My sons have received 22 birthday gifts on the day of their birthday that they wanted. Not once in 22 years have they received the day after radioactive guilt gift from the only place that would still take a hot check from me. You know, here's some drywall, boys. Uh, Kids are loving the drywall. My, my, my younger son's birthday is in a couple of weeks, and I spent the weekend with him last weekend, and I had that great talk with him. Jess, what do you want for your birthday, man? We had this great talk about it, you know. He wants a certain kind of belt buckle, non-representational. You know, he doesn't want it to be like the portrait of somebody. We just had this great time, you know. I did things on my son's birthdays in my house that I would not share publicly at an AA group. They were so injurious and so embarrassing. And um, God, I'm such a good parent now. And I'm not saying I don't make mistakes, but I'm, I'm, 
I'm resentful at Scott for being a bad father. It affects my self-esteem, pocketbook ambition, personal relations to sex, a five-bagger for sure. What does it mean that if God would remove the resentment, it would be gone? Well, I'm ashamed and I'm guilty. I'm not trusting in God. If I trusted in God, I would stop punishing myself the way I am. I'm, uh, at the time I wrote this, I had to write I'm impatient because I'm not giving myself a chance to do the right thing. You know, I was pretty new. It was my fourth step. I was fresh out of being a da- bad da- father. Uh, so I was impatient. You know, it says in the chapter of the family afterward, we, you know, we tend to try to get something done real quick because it's so awful when you actually stop drinking and you take the whooping, you know. If I really had gotten the enormity of a lot of the injury I'd done, if I really had gotten it, I don't know that I could have stayed here. I think it just would have broke my back. I couldn't fit the pain in my head. I Thank God. If I had remembered everything, I would have looked like an outtake from scanners. My head would just would have blown up, you know. Um, it came to me slowly, and it came to me, and it was really revealed – as, you know, it's like a dentist, you know, when a dentist takes that little tool and gets a pin prick and opens it, and it's like the Carlsbad Caverns in there. That, that's very similar to a lot of the inventory I've done where I'll take one item and it'll kind of open a little world there that I've got to take a look at. And there's a difference between self-examination and self-obsession. Um, uh, if this stuff and this self-examination is not connected to changing the way I behave, and finding and asking about solutions and finding people who in the problem seems to have been solved, then it's just going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy after a while. You know, um, What are the other defects? I'm punishing. Uh, and you know what? Another defect is I'm irresponsible. I was an irresponsible father. It's true that I was a bad father. That, that's, that's the truth. You know, Why does it feel bad? Because it, it was. Um, I'm uh, dishonest, I'm filled with self-delusion, and um, it's interesting. A defect for me, a very interesting defect, is fear of confrontation. Um, Years ago, my older son, Micah, I was, I think, about four years sober by this time, so he was about 10, and Jesse was 7, and um, Jesse broke his wrist in a schoolyard accident, and in a little kid, it it got broken in a growth plane, which is cartilage that that turns to bone. And if it gets disrupted, if it gets set, you can't mess with it because if it it doesn't heal right, it can be a bad permanent deal for the kid. So he gets a cast. He's a younger brother, so it's a weapon. The cast is a weapon. And um, he gets home, and, you know, the playing field's a little more level now with the cast, which he's delighted about. So he just he wants to show his brother his cast up close and personal as quick as he can. And, you know, they're boys. They're beating the crap out of each other in about ten minutes. And it, it had to be zero tolerance. I couldn't let him do this because if it screwed up his arm, it would be bad. It wasn't something I could repeat 11 times, uh, you know. So I got up in Micah's face, and I yelled at him, and I just shut it down. And Micah, who's 10 turned away from me, stormed into his room, and slammed the door. So he slammed the door. So I got the dad tick going now. I slammed the door, you know. And I go to the door, I open the door, and before I can unload on him, he looks up at me and he says, hold it a second. I didn't say you were wrong out there. You were right about what you were saying. But a huge guy just got in my face and screamed and yelled, I didn't say you were wrong. Don't tell me I can't be mad. (laughs) <laughs> what the hell is that? What is that? <laughs> well, it was something he had been watching his mother and I doing with varying degrees of success and failure. I know how to repress, just crush it back down and wind up climbing into a clock tower with a high-powered rifle, you know. <laughs> I know how to bully you, scream and yell, or cry. Either one's fine with me. I've always enjoyed the tyranny of helplessness or, or the volume. Volume or crying, either one's fine in a pinch. <laughs> but to stand up for myself and tell you how I feel without telling you what to do, to take no crap and to give no crap, wow, that's overcoming a fear of confrontation. And that's what Micah did in that moment. He didn't say I was wrong. He didn't say don't talk to me that way. He said, I get it. It made me angry. Don't tell me I can't be angry. I'm not telling you that you're not wrong. I am, I am respecting you, 
and uh, you ought to respect me. I don't know if you're going to, but you ought to because I'm respecting me by doing this. What, what, a, what a remarkable thing that is, you know. And um, fear of confrontation has appeared as a defect in my inventory many, many times, you know, because there's times I need to really sit down and explain a few things to my boss, and I don't want to overcome a fear of confrontation. I want to give him a piece of my mind, no matter how small a piece it might be by that time. I would like to share it, and it's usually a pretty small piece by that time. Or I'm not going to say anything, and I'm going to suffer. But to, to tell you how I feel without telling you what to do, man, that is really an extraordinary thing. I'm resentful at Nazis for slaughtering Jews during World War II. What are the defects of character in me that if God would remove the resentment would be gone? What are the defects of character in me that if God would remove the resentment would be gone? What a great question to ask myself about each resentment. What is it specifically in this resentment that if God were to remove. Now, is it the same all the time? No. No. Is it similar? Quite often similar. But there's different elements to it. And I want to be, I don't want to get, I don't want to talk about how many Bill Wilsons can dance on the head of a pen. I don't want to micromanage this thing. But I like to be specific. When I go to God in 6 and 7, and or I go to him in 3, and I say, Pop, I'm yours. And he says, well, yeah, I'm God. I knew that. It's awfully generous of you, but I kind of got that already. You know, I'm God. And I say, take me. And he goes, well, yeah, sure, what? And I go, well, take this. Take this. Take this. What can I do? I need your help. What kind of demonstration can I make? How can I use this as a, as a fire-starting moment, a flashpoint, a uh, uh, a doorway to change or to understanding or to love or to forgiveness. How can I empathize? Empathy is not excuse. Empathy, I used to think pity was pathetic. I used to think that pity was patronizing. But the defect of being unpitying is a terrible sickness. I, can, I, I'm, I, I can't be helpful to all people, but I must at least take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one, you know. And um, so when I did this thing against Nazis, my sponsor told me that thing, that gorgeous, because I said, I have, let's try none. I have no defects here. We're talking about <laughs> Nazis. What the hell are you talking about? And Don said to me, he changed my life in that moment. I had no idea how much he was turning my ship. But when he said to me, You're, you don't understand the question. They're not asking if the, uh, uh, if the event was your fault. They're asking if the resentment was your fault. Was the event your fault? No. Was the event my fault around my aunt abusing me? No. Is the resentment my fault? Every time, without a loophole and an exception. What would a normal person do if they were against Nazis or disliked my aunt for abusing them? They, they might do a lot of stuff. In the case of the Nazis, they might um, work against the Nazis, join political organizations that fight them. They might uh, um, put, uh, uh, contribute funds to those organizations. They might carry the good news. They might do a lot of stuff. But I didn't do any of that stuff. I just talked a lot of long crap and, and uh, never got out of the house. So what are the defects in me? Well, I'm an opportunist. I kind of use this for my own deal. I was filled with self-pity. Self-pity is, if you could bottle self-pity, it would not crack off the market in a week. It's just better. It's more available. Um, I get a little lump in my throat. My eyes water up. I lean forward. It's good dope, man. You know, And... Um, it's a narco it really is a narcotic, isn't that the truth for me, for sure. <clears throat> um, and as we talked, as we talked about, when I say we, I mean me. As I talked about in the beginning of the workshop, I've got to be, get rid of this selfishness. I've got or, I've got or it kills me. You know. So when I write this inventory, I like to be as specific as I can with God. Selfish, self-centered, and self-seeking. Selfish is kind of wanting it all for me. Self-seeking is trying to figure out what's in it for me. And self-centered is kind of figuring that it's all about me. So they're, they're the same and they're different. They're a little, little, little spin, a little different English on them. And again, I like to be as specific as I can when I go to my, 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 my father in that, in that fire-starting moment of six and seven. You know, um, you know what I think I'm going to do, guys? I think we're going to take one more break and then drive it through to lunch. Why don't we do that?
and I'm, I'm starting to talk about six and seven. I feel a shift coming on here. So why don't we take uh, we'll take five minutes, try to keep it to five, and then we'll have one more session. And any uh, if you got them, smoke them. And I'm an alcoholic. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, God. grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I want to, uh, some, we got some stuff in the basket. I want to address that, and uh, then we'll uh, finish up uh, we'll, uh, by our, uh, uh, noon. Uh, and I, I just want to talk about step four. Probably may, maybe wheedle my way into step five a little bit before we break. Um, someone wrote, what happened with the AA group written up in Newsweek, and why did they get written up? Uh, it's in la- last week's Newsweek. It's the uh, group called the Midtown Group in um, Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm not breaking their anonymity. It's in Newsweek. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, um, the accusations were they participate in uh, sexual exploitation of young women, and uh, that there was, uh, they present it. Uh, I thought it was a, such a well-written article um, because they, uh, the writer says this is a splinter group from AA, uh, which I'm sure that member, many members of the group don't view themselves as a splinter group from AA. But, and they say uh, that this is outside of uh, the, uh, what's accepted as the mainstream tenets of Alcoholics Anonymous. So they don't present it as an indictment of Alcoholics Anonymous. There was a news story there because there was some accusations made by a young woman who said that she was exploited. Um, The other thing that I think was attractive as a news item is that the report included the fact that they were, had cordoned themselves off, that people were throwing away people's cell phones, they were told not to call people, they were told not to attend meetings outside of that group. So that's the basic idea. It's on the web. It's out there. It's weird. (laughs) And... um, in my area, there's some uh, AA groups that have uh, separated themselves from Alcoholics Anonymous, um, both uh, in Al-Anon and AA. Uh, my wife and I, a lot of uh, people feel very, who have felt very deeply wounded by these groups have come to me and my wife uh, for help. And some of the men I sponsor, I've had incredible experiences uh, watching them open their heart and their minds and... Uh, and just seeing that there's a different way, just that there's a different way. Many of the people who come to me wounded from other AA groups um, cannot bear being treated well, and they move on. And they, When someone comes to me and says, I need someone to kick my ass, I go, eh, thanks for playing. You'll be finding someone else because I'm not I, – I can't imagine why I wanna, would want to be your ass kicker. Why, why would I want to? Why is it going to be my job to rope in your superego and punish your libido and your id? I can come up with something else during the day I'd rather do, you know. Um, uh, so, but that's just me. I mean, this is why God made more than one of us. You know, I mean, I've shared at meetings that this ass-kicking thing is something I've avoided, and I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, well, it saved my life. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just sharing my, my personal experience. <clears throat> Is there anything you would suggest to help with over sober? Yes, absolutely, and I'll tell you exactly what I've done. I'm resentful at the North Hollywood group for being a bunch of sick, moronic, hurtful people. It affects my self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, and sex. The North Hollywood group is a big, big AA group. A lot of people go there. A lot of people say they're being helped there. These meetings... I, I have attended them, and I have wanted to take my own life during the meeting. I, um, my sponsor gave me three tools to make my way through unpleasant sharing. These are the three tools. He said, uh, remember that everything in Alcoholics Anonymous needs to be said. You might not be on the list of people who needs to hear it. How many times have I taken a newcomer to a meeting, and it has been the worst meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous ever held? And I think, well, so much for that 12-step call. They'll be running, screaming into the night. And we walk out, and the guy turns to me and goes, man, that was absolutely amazing. Can we come back here next week? And I'm thinking, sure, if you shoot me in the lips, maybe I'll come back here. (laughs) Everything that gets said at an AA meeting needs to be said, even though don't don't make me the arbiter, you know. Um... The second thing 
he said to me, as he said, are you willing to take the following chance with your life? When the guy is sharing something you don't want to hear, are you willing to go to the podium, tap him on the shoulder, and say, shut the hell up and sit down because I'm going to talk now? And so far, I'm not saying I haven't wanted to do that, <laughs> but I haven't been willing to take that chance with my life. And the third thing he said to me is, when it's going on and you're listening to it, remember, they're going to stop. <laughs> they're going to stop. It's going to end. And when I'm in the middle of it, it feels like it's not going to end. I was a long time ago in my home group. A guy walked up to this. This is a guy who, when he shared, people literally threw ropes over the rafters. They hung themselves. While this. It, was like, it was like that airplane movie where people kill themselves any time the guy started. This is what this guy was like. Blah, 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 blah. And he walked up to me at the end of a meeting, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, you know what? You really haven't been there for me, and I'm, I need to move on with sponsorship. I had no recollection of him ever asking me to sponsor him. I had no recollection of ever sponsoring him. All I got was the good part, getting fired. It was like all I got was the whipped cream. I just got the good stuff, you know. At any rate, the way I have uh, avoided being over sober is when I write these resentments against these groups or against people who I think are doing it really bad and people who I think are misusing Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the defects that comes up over and over again is spiritual pride. Now, I didn't get spiritual pride till I came into AA and became a spiritual Goliath. I, I didn't come in with equipped with spiritual pride. I, I got it here. I caught spiritual pride here. So if I'm really going to get out of spiritual pride, number one, it doesn't mean that I have... Acceptance is not compliance. It's not. Acceptance is accepting so that I can keep my head in the clouds and my feet on the ground. So I can keep my head in the fight and my heart at the lotus feet of the Lord. You know? So I can overcome a fear of confrontation and, and express myself without having, I can make an evaluation without a judgment. I can move through the landscape of that thing with a good heart. You know, when I just told you about the Midtown group, I didn't say they were bad. I don't know that. I know what I want to be around and not be around. I know that I have been called by injured members of that group, and I didn't believe them at first about what was going on. And then I started, it was just, it was, the, the, the testimony was, you know, it was, I could only go, la, 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 after a while if I didn't want to buy it. So that's what is, that has been the main gateway to prevent me from being over sober is, the, is, is being able to write the resentments against them, and then eventually the resentments against myself. It says in our book, when it was remorse, we were sore at ourselves. And I don't know about you, but the resentments against myself have been horrible. I do inventories now, sometimes no one else but me shows up on it. I want to challenge an idea that you might have. Why, and I'm going to present it as myself, but I'm, I'm asking you at the same time, why am I so willing to believe the worst about myself? Why? Why? I don't believe the worst about you. I met you this morning. I thought the best of you before you even walked in. I thought, oh, well, remember, this group's going to show up, and it'll be fun, and we'll have a chat, and, you know, and, you know, we did. <laughs> you know, it was, I, I thought the best of you before I met you, you know. Why am I not willing often to afford myself that beautiful privilege, that opportunity? Why am I so willing? It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea, and I want to put it on the table. Nothing, St. Paul said, nothing can stand the light. Everything disappears when it's held up to the light. Rumi, the great Sufi poet, says everything, the past and the future, is burnt up by the light. Very few things can, under, can, can, uh, can withstand God's truth. And I find in AA that once you start telling the truth, it's hard to stop, you know. I'm not telling about, talking about hurtful truth. When people, Brent and I were talking about this the other day, when I've had some amends made to me in AA that have been some of the most deranged amends I've ever heard. You know, I used to think you were a disgusting bozo, but I don't anymore. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> what book are you reading? I judge no man. <clears throat> Putting your partner in a relationship before yourself or selfishness. Well... I find this to be, uh, for me, I believe in self-interested altruism. 
I believe that in this death of self, I am being self-serving in the most wonderful way possible. Um, I believe that I can't, that if myself and my, whoever it is, my wife or my sons or my associates, if we both put 50% in to the deal, that we're going to wind up with 50%, that the only way to do it is to be, is to put 100% in. Um, one of the main ways of um, defect, two defects that keep me from doing this is mind reading and not living in today. And also blackmail. Blackmail is another big defect of mine. Um, if you do this, I'll do this. Or I would do this, but I don't think you've done enough of this. I, I don't think you had the right facial expression when you just gave that to me. It's like the Scott Redmond mime theater, I call it. It's to, um, so... Um, I believe, for me, that my, my demonstrations, my acts of charity, of love, and of service are all self-serving in the most wonderful way possible, that it's self-interested altruism. And for me to say that it's not, for me personally, is it's just simply not true. I've never seen people get more out of being good <laughs> than I do in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, uh, it's a perfect spiritual machine. It's a spiritual engine that's fed by, by self-seeking and opportunism the best kind possible, you know. So for me to put my partner first, I rarely do it anonymously. Uh, I, I, um, uh, I might try to do it anonymously, but eventually the anonymous engine breaks down and I'll... By the way, did you see that at all? That I did, that, did you notice that there were no dirty dishes? Um, Chris Rock does the, one of the things in one of his routines, which I love. He says, uh, uh, a guy said to him, you know, I've never been to jail. And Rock says, you're not supposed to go to jail. <laughs> he says, because the guy's kind of bragging about it. He says, you're, you're not supposed to, you know. And, you know, I'll go, you know, I, I did the dishes. You're supposed to do the dishes. I think that it's some way that um, housework should equal sex that there should be like conversion tables on the back of cleaning products of housework to sex you know the, so that's how giving i'm being you know i, I <laughs> whenever i share that there's always one guy who thinks marketing you know he's he really um the thing i have found about putting my partner first about being of service and being helpful is, you know, one of the things I say to my, the guys I sponsor, and I really mean it, is I say, give me the whole story and spare me no details. I want to hear the whole story. When a guy calls me, and some of the guys I sponsor actually say, how are you? It's not a common plight that they have, but some of them. I don't think I've ever gotten off the phone with Brent Swift and him not saying, how are you? You know, which makes me feel very cared for. Quite often, I'll say, you know what, let's skip me and go right to you. I need you, pal. I need to know the whole thing. And I'll lay on my bed sometimes and put the phone next to me so I can hear it, and I'll literally feel self fall away. But with no 10, there's no 12. Uh, I will eventually get over sober. I will separate myself. So what I'm getting to with, with my partner, with putting my partner first, is it becomes a great joy for me. It tickles me. It's a curiosity that I would do such a thing. <laughs> um, my family, before I got sober, we were driving um, uh, on a road called Rim of the World. It's a gorgeous road up in uh, the mountains above L.A. And, it's, and my whole family is going, and they're looking out at this pa panorama, and they're going, oh, that's so beautiful. And I'm going, yeah, it really is. And all of them realized all at once that I was looking at myself in the rearview mirror, that I was not... <laughs> I was not, and they just went, oh, dude, <laughs> dude, you are, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> so, um, it's a problem, but I, I, that, that, that demonstration of putting my partner uh, first, I've, 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 um, I, I'm, devo I'm, I've jettisoned the idea that I can, that I'm, go that I'm good. And that it's it's a it, it's a delight to me. Um, I hope that's helpful. And um, you mentioned a Hindu tract that was a good read. Will you please spell the name? 
I don't know how to spell the name. It's Bhagavad Gita. I bet you if you go to the library and you mention it, they'll know exactly what you mean, but I don't know. It's a weird spelling, but it's the Bhagavad Gita. It's part of a, a bunch of books that are the holiest books uh, for the Hindus, and it's one section, which is about this, um, uh, about this battle, this great battle. Uh, so what are the defects of character in me that if God would remove the resentment would be gone? I'm resentful at X for being uh, an AA blowhard and big shot, affecting my self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, and sex. What are the defects of character? Well, I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous. I am a bully and a hypocrite. Because I want to teach them a, a, the lesson that they're trying to teach other people. Right. Um, I, am, I have spiritual pride. <clears throat> and I'm unwilling to accept the fact that another child of God could be spiritually sick like me. Now, if I could accept the fact that they were spiritual, spiritually sick, I wouldn't resent any of them. I'd show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience I would cheerfully grant the sick friend. I'm unwilling to accept the fact that X, and I put the name in so it's not sort of a, a, a mechanical rubber stamp. I, uh, I, I, I'm unwilling to accept the fact that X is another child of God who could be spiritually sick like me. Why do I say could? Because it says I have to quit playing God. So I'm not going to say is spiritually sick. I don't know if they're spiritually sick. It's possible. And I'm unwilling to even accept the possibility. So they're not just one of God's kids who could be spiritually sick. They're a bunch of hosebags who should die in a flaming car crash. Right? <laughs> And when I have enough people in the lazy Susan of my mind who have to die, they have to die. They have to die or be exposed. They have to die, be exposed, be punished. Be puni Either one's fine. Or a combination of three. <laughs> Punish them, expose them, then kill them. That's really the best. Um, because I don't just dislike these people. I re-experience the hatred. When I wake up, I water it like a little flower. I want to make sure it's good and it's robust and it's growing and well cared for. The worst thing for me is when I forget to hate something, you know. And like a guy will go, hi. And I go, hi. Oh, I hate him. Why did I do that? Oh, no. And now I'm going to have to like redouble my snubbing just to like get back to where we were, where I thought he knew I hated him, you know. <laughs> Isn't he reading my mind? It's a short read, believe me, but isn't he reading my mind? You have enough of this activity. I'm sorry, you don't have a life. Let me rephrase that. I have enough of this activity. I don't have a life. I just don't, you know. So this defect of being unwilling to accept the fact that another child of God could be spiritually sick. Now, when I write it, I'm resentful at Scott for being a bad father. It's a little different. I know I'm spiritually sick. It says on page 65, we've not only been mentally and physically sick, we've been spiritually sick. If you're an alcoholic, you're spiritually sick. I know I'm an alcoholic. So in, when I write the defect about me, I say, I am unwilling to accept the fact that Scott is another child of God who is spiritually sick. If I could accept the fact that I'm spiritually sick, I'd show myself the same tolerance, pity, and patience I would cheerfully grant the sick friend. I, you know, I know that people use a practice. It's a lovely practice of praying for people they're resentful for. It's never been useful for me. I know that it's useful. Guys I sponsor do it. It's just, I'm not a, a suicide guy. I'm a homicide guy. I, I've always vastly preferred your death to mine. I always have. You know, I, you, you first. I've, uh, the, the, <laughs> the headline I've always seen in my head is Scott Redman kills wife, kills children, and refuses to commit suicide. You know, I, that's the, always the one. And I'm not, and this is not an indictment of the suicide people. I am not knocking the suicide people here. It's just kind of the flip side of the same coin, really, you know. But for me, you're, you're first. And um, so I had a lot of resentments against people, a lot of resentments against people. And one of the things my sponsor urged me to do was to ask myself a question. When you write a resentment against somebody, ask yourself, do you have a resentment against yourself in connection with this resentment? Let's try to clean out the whole cavity. That's been very helpful to me. Sometimes, many times I don't. I don't. I just hate you. <laughs> I'm fine with just hating you. <laughs> but sometimes there's some extracurricular activity, and I throw myself into the fire too. You know. Um, the uh, I'm supposed to write resentments against people, institutions, and principles. So the institutions for me were, you know, a lot of governments. There was uh, 
government of South Africa, uh, government of the Soviet Union, uh, I had a, uh, some banks, some religious institutions, some schools. And principles are really interesting. If we're really truthful, we'll really step up to that. You know, uh, There's the Christian ethic, the work ethic as a principle. You know, uh, doing to others is a principle. Um, racism is a principle. And the reverse of racism, you know, which is uh, that uh, all races are okay. That's a principle. I've, uh, I've had a uh, sponsor, a guy who used to have a picture of a Nazi flag in his room. And um, I sponsored him. And... Uh, because I had done my inventory and I had written the resentment against Nazis and I had written the defects of character and I had prayed about it and I had forgiven, you know. And um, I started sponsoring him. He did an inventory. He read me the inventory. There was a lot of really horrific stuff, as you can well imagine, on the inventory. And a couple of years later, when my older son was bar mitzvahed, this guy called me and said, what should I wear to the bar mitzvah and what is an appropriate gift to bring? Yeah. I don't know how many places that's happening, but I know it's happening at our house. You know, A couple of years after that, he asked me if I could um, marry him and his wife. They had gotten me a... Um, uh, they got me, a, I don't know what the word is, but credited or... I was a ma legally made a assistant, a deputy commissioner of marriages in the county of Los Angeles for one day, and I legally married them. I don't think that went out on the Nazi Gazette that night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to marry legally anybody I wanted that day. I wanted to go down on like Skid Row and just like marry everybody, you know. It's just such a cool feeling to be able to marry. And then it went to my head. <laughs> do you? You do? You're married. Um, <clears throat> but what a day. What an extraordinary day, you know, that was. Without the inventory, that day certainly doesn't take place, you know. Um, uh, it says, after we write our resentments against people, institutions, and principles, against um, myself, when it was remorse, I was sore at myself, and I write the corresponding defects of character. One thing I like to do is I like to write, write the resentments and then write the def uh, uh, individual defect list for each resentment. They don't have to be 40 pages long. I'm, again, I'm not talking about micromanaging or making this impossible. It could be three, four, five defects. Not, not a big deal. But the reason why is I like to read, I'm resentful at Scott for being a bad father, what it affects, what the defects are. And I like to have it on a different piece of paper. I number them so the corresponding list is there. Because when I go to God in 6 and 7, I'm going to go to God with the defect list, not the resentment list. I like to put that resentment list aside and just go to him with the thing that's killing me. What's killing me is this spiritual tapeworm. What's killing me are these defects that I'm not only not getting rid of, I'm encouraging. You know, I'm watering them like a little flower. I'm so right I'm mind-shatteringly right. Um, and then it says we do a fearless. And uh, we write a fearless. It's such an interesting presentation. It says we write fears not in connection with personal resentment. Now, I'm frightened of the police, but I'm also, I've been knocking over 7-Elevens. And I'm resentful at myself for knocking over 7-Eleven. So the, 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 the fear of the police is not a real fear. It's going to lead me to writing more resentments. I'm frightened of success. I'm frightened of failure. I'm frightened of AIDS. I'm frightened of hepatitis C. I'm frightened of the dark. I'm frightened of the light. I'm frightened of being alone, and I'm frightened of being with people. How do you have a life? Once you've painted yourself into that spiritual corner, there's no oxygen left. There's no air. There's no light. How do you have a life? And I've heard these fears. Every one of them I've just mentioned, I've heard them on most of the inventories that I hear. Now, if we wanted to be nitpicking, and I find it so useless to, to be a nitpicker when it comes to the inventory process, I'm just talking about tools I've used that have been really helpful to me. I don't think it's the right or wrong way at all, at all. You know, The minute I say, how can you stay sober and do that? You call that sponsorship, then I'm over sober. Then I better sit down and write those resentments so that I can be part of the deal again, you know. 
Um, uh, I could make a case for every single one of those fears having a connecting resentment to it, but I don't want to. When it, when it presents as a fear that I experience just as pure fear, I write it on that. And when I write the, the, the fear list, I write, I am frightened of. I am frightened of se- sex. I am frightened of, of uh, success. I am frightened of failure. Now it says that um, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our problem, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Now I've never heard an inventory with a hundred forms of fear, um, and that's fine. I don't mind missing out on that. <laughs> and if it's fear, if it's 25 of each or 100, I, I don't care. It's a lot. It's enough to kill me. And that's the very simple second section of the inventory as far as I can see it. It doesn't ask me to attach any quantity or any defects that feed it. It just says I write down my fears. I made a list of my fears. And then the incredible sexual inventory on page 62 for me, one of the great transforming pieces in all of our spiritual treatment, the chance I get to really implement this mysterious idea of moral psychology. It says that I'm going to write about seven points. Where was I selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate, unjustifiably aroused jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness, and what I should have done instead, not what I could have done, not what I could have done. Most of my love affairs looked like the opening scene of a CSI episode. Um, you should stop, Scott. Everyone's dead. You know, um, the, the, uh, it was bad. It was bad. And um, it's not what I could have done. What I could have done was what I did. What should I have done? And, th- and in the last two paragraphs, it, it, it describes a relationship, an active, living, breathing, ongoing re- developmental relationship with God that I think is unequaled in our literature and in my experience. It says, in this way, I try to shape a sound, safe and sound ideal for my future sex life. I don't use the word sex. I just say for my future life. It says that I draw close to God. I tell him what I should be doing instead. What kind of man do I want to be? What kind of organ do I want to be for the the ever-advancing spearhead of God's will and purpose, which is a mystery to me. But I know what it feels like to take a step away from a drink and a step toward a drink. That's the acid test for me. This is all about not drinking. 100% about not drinking. If that's the kernel of it, if the acid test for me is it a step toward a drink or away from a drink, I, I've heard in AA it's not about not drinking anymore, it's about living. I understand that. I don't feel that way. I feel that it's 100% about not drinking. But I'm not focused on not drinking. I'm taking these seemingly disconnected, I'm, I am focused on it when I'm trying to get you through 24 hours when you've got a week and a half and your brains are leaking out the back of your head. You know, um, I ask God what to do in each individual situation. I ask God to help shape me and mold me and help me walk toward that. That's a process. That's the future. That's the now. That's in the moment. Right here, right now. Because that's all that exists. My brain would have me not believe that. My brain is like a dog with a bone. You know that And sometimes I get into my car now and I actually decide what I want to do. I actually sometimes get in my car and I go, what do you want to do? You want to think? You think for a while. Do you want to work on this piece of writing that you got in your head? Would you like to work on that? What do you want to do? In the past, it was just I get in the car and I'm, I'm there for the ride. I'm going to do whatever the hell my brain tells me. My brain, I'm, I am ravaged by thought. I'm going to do whatever my brain tells me to do, whenever it tells me to do it, forever, how long. But I actually... Because of my spiritual practice, and I've been practicing this spiritual stuff. I've been doing it since I'm six months sober, and I'm not bragging. I'm just here to tell my story. I have not spent any appreciable amount of time in those 21 and a half years not doing it. I just haven't experienced that of drifting away and then and stopping and then and then coming back. Um, and that just doesn't make me good. It makes me – I've had the Scott Redman experience for the past 22 years. Um, but – I, at times, use my brain instead of my brain using me. That, that's remarkable. You know? If you ask a tree or an eagle what time it is, they don't care. That's psychological time. You know? And what my spiritual teachers tell me, if you, if you have a kid 
or if you have a pet, or if you're in touch with other human beings. <laughs> There's a peripheral vision. Sometimes if you're with a, somebody who has a child and you're with them, they will perk up and leave the room because they've heard something you don't hear. You just don't hear it. They have a peripheral vision around that other being, you know. Um, and it can happen with a pet. It can happen with a lot of different things. You literally will hear, uh, feel a, a air move, <laughs> and you'll react to it. And what a lot of the mystics say is, what a great way to live, to, to be able to live in the spirit with a peripheral vision about these worldly troubles and bothers, to be able to have a choice of whether or not to engage those instead of grinding it, grinding it, grinding it. I show up at my home group, and what I'm there to do right off the bat is take attendance and gather evidence. That's what I'm doing, man. I walk in, let's go, let's kill, you know, let's kill them all, and we'll sort them out later. But I'm going to start evidence gathering right away. What a terrible defect evidence gathering is. There's just no, there's no way to, you, you don't win in that world at all. You know, and now I'm grinding it. I'm in reality. You're going to join me in reality, whether you like it or not. And we're going to grind. There's no, my gums are bleeding already. Instead of, of, of engaging in this incredible spiritual democracy. So what should I be doing instead? In this way, I try, try to shape a sound ideal for my future sex life, my future life. So the answer isn't always... I shouldn't have lied. I should have missionary style position sex for the sole purpose of procreation for the rest of my life and then die. Maybe my ideal is I want to have a great romance. Maybe my ideal is I want to have a great, exciting sex life, and I want to, be, I want to do that in a truthful and honest way with my eyes open and, and be loving and, and charitable and giving and, be, and give pleasure. And ha- oh, I don't know what it is. Maybe I want to be honest and be able to uh, not bully you with my honesty. I don't know what it is. I don't know what your ideal is. In the, in the preceding page to that, it talks about something that I think when the book was written is kind of a mirror of the two school, you know, there were two AA camps kind of in New York and in Akron. In Akron, they were still very, very steeped and very connected um, to the Oxford group uh, and to... Uh, first century Christian teachings. In New York, there were a lot of deranged intellectuals and artists. Big shock there. And, um, and in, you know, he, Bill does this gorgeous thing. You know, he says, look, some of you might think that this is a, a function of our baser, you know, needs, that this is, should be one flavor and that's it. And some of you think that you should just be, you know, having sex with the world, you know, uh, and, and, and he says the beautiful thing. We will not be the arbiter of anybody's sexual behavior. We just won't do it. We've got to quit playing God, you know. So um, years ago, a guy came to me for help. He was engaging in a sexual behavior that was very injurious to him, and uh, actually people were getting uh, physically injured in it. And he came to me, he heard me share, and I showed him how to do a sexual inventory, and we did some work on it for a while, and he, can, he could not stop doing it. And he said to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, well, let's try this. Uh, you, right now, you don't have God's voice in your head, you just have your voice in your head, so let's put another voice in your head. And I'm going to tell you, if you do it again, I'll, I won't work with you anymore. And he said, okay. okay. And he did it the next day, and he called me, he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm not going to work with you anymore. And he said, you're a Nazi son of a bitch and hung the phone up on me. And I was wrong. I was wrong. Here's the truth. The truth is, is it was too hard for me. That was the truth. It was too scary for me. I didn't know about it. I didn't know what to do with it. And it was, it was, uh, I had some spiritual pride and I wasn't able to say to him the truth. Oh, I love you. This is too hard for me. I'm, it's too confusing and it's too hard and I can't do this with you. You know, maybe you can go to another 12-step program or talk to another person or get some therapy or go to a mental institution. If you know, I don't know what you need to do. But instead of telling him the truth, I volunteered to be the enforcer of his superego, right? Say, well, I'll put another voice in your head. So what? <laughs> you know, it's just another thing he's screwing up. Another thing he's disappointing. Another thing he's doing wrong. That's all it is, you know. So it's interesting for me to look at that. I had chosen, I volunteered 
to be the arbiter of his behavior. That's really, at the end of the day, what I did. And I did it in a, you know, a lovely giving way, which is better. Instead of having a finger in his face, you know, uh, 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 and the truth was, is it was, boy, what a great thing to be able to say that. This is too hard for me. It's just too hard for me, you know. Not that you're wrong and I'm right and this is the way to do it. Um, so when a guy reads me a fifth step and he, he's going to, if he does sexual inventories and writes about, I, I put the uh, name of the people who were injured on the top of the page. Sometimes I was injured and no one else was. You know, uh, sometimes someone else was injured and I wasn't. Sometimes I was injured, my kids, my wife, the other person's family, and there's a whole bunch of people. I put the names of the people who were injured on top of the page, and then I write about where I've been selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate, unjustifiably aroused jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness, and what I should have done instead, not what I could have done, the kind of man that I'd like to be. And as I've developed in this inventory process, when I write about, and look, I don't have to have sex to write a sexual inventory, you know. Most of my sex is a very solitary endeavor anyway, but I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't have to have actually contact with another human being. This, <laughs> thank God, otherwise I'd do very little writing. But, uh, um, but you, uh, this is about my relationships with people. You know, it can be about a situation at work. It can be about a situation in my marriage. It can be about the interior of all those things, and I'm being selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate, unjustifiably arousing jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness. Sometimes the jealousy is, well, I'm just jealousy of people who I think are having more fun than me or having a normal life, and I don't feel normal. I feel injured and misshapen and, and uh, bad, you know. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's just as ugly when I'm the arbiter of my own behavior, you know. Um, so th this, this uh, when, when a guy uh, comes and does his fifth step, what I ask him to do is take all the pieces where he wrote what I should be doing instead. Just like I'm laying the resentments aside and bringing the defects of character to God, I ask him to take all the instances where he says what I should be doing instead and put them all in one section. So that in 6 and 7, and we're going to come back after lunch and talk about 6 and 7, which is really the big brass ring. It's really the centerpiece for my, my relationship with my higher power. Um, uh, is that he can bring that to God and, and then ask to be shaped, ask to walk toward that in concert with God, to have moral psychology. You know, normal psychology is, uh, you know, if you're neurotic, I don't know if anybody here has ever been referred to as a neurotic before, but um, neuro uh, a neurosis is, uh, <laughs> a couple of people are laughing, um, a little identification, me too, um, is if you have anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. And then you come up with a way to resolve the anxiety. And it's a bad idea. It's just a bad idea. It's like I swallow all the nitroglycerin and start smashing my body into the wall trying to explode. Actually, my, my solution's worse than my problem. Okay, I don't know if that resonates for anybody here. My, 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 like my dental problem that I was going to relieve with a hot needle into my gum. Um... <clears throat> So I go to therapy, and what the idea of most conventional therapy is to uncover, discover, and unravel, to free associate, to delve into my past, and to come up with a better resolution for my anxiety. It works for millions of people. It's used all over the planet. But I have alcoholism. So I go to therapy. The therapist says, how are you? I said, terrible. Why? Well, yesterday I was, I was too drunk to walk, so I drove. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. Let me ask you a question. What were you thinking just before you did it? Nothing. <laughs> How do you feel? Terrible. I feel terrible. Why? Well, yesterday, um, I sharpened a hypodermic needle on the back of a matchbook striker and sucked some heroin up through a fluffed-up cigarette filter, and I injected it. I just feel miserable. <laughs> what were you thinking just before you did it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. My mouth flooded with saliva. The room spun. I went out for cigarettes and wound up in Baltimore. And that's all I remember. Nothing. Treat that. Treat nothing. You would need a panel of therapists working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to put my crap in a file and put it on a shelf. My alcoholism is so efficient in generating pathology, neurosis, difficult times, hurt feelings, broken experiences. You can't. It's not a fair fight. Absolutely not a fair fight. Um, 
boy, how did I fall down this rabbit hole? I'm usually pretty good. I don't even know how I wound up here. <laughs> Thank God it's almost over. <laughs> Moral psychology is to uncover, discover, and apply. That if, if, with regular psychology, to come up with a better resolution for my anxiety is a very successful thing to do, and millions of people do it. And what I have to do is uncover, discover, and have a moral application for my self-discovery. Because when I go to you and I sit you down and I give you instructions on how to do a sexual inventory, and I am a free man. I'm a free man. I've still got problems. No, 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 really. I've had problems in sobriety. Really, really. I know there are people who haven't, and I'm so, so glad for them. Uh, I, <laughs> I am not in their numbers. I've had plenty of problems. You know, with sex, with money, with all sorts of stuff in sobriety. And that's why I've hung out with people who talk about that later on in sobriety. Otherwise, I will, um, I'll be sober with a gun in my mouth, you know. And, um, you know, it's so funny. Some of the guys I sponsor get very angry at themselves when they, um, when they have to do a 10-step or they have a resentment. And one of the things I'm fond of saying is, you know, I get the common cold a couple of times a year. Why do you think you can move through this landscape of life and not get spiritually sick once in a while? I mean, my problem is that I'm spiritually sick. My problem is that I'm separated. I'm separated by a self-centeredness that keeps me in the loop of active alcoholism. I get really scared when a guy's never got anything, never got any business. And by the way, I don't have a jauntous view of that. I think there are some people who really just get free and stay free, and that's fine. And I'm happy for them. I'm just not in their number. I, I might be someday. I don't feel particularly close at this point, but uh, but I live uh, I live pretty free most of the time. At any rate, um, that form of moral psychology to me is expressed so beautifully in the sexual inventory about uh, about joining in a relationship with God and and uh, and moving forward and being shaped and in that partnership with my higher power. Um, my sons are 28 and 25. They were six and three when I got sober. And uh, years ago, when my son Micah was uh, babysitting for a guy on the, this couple in the fellowship, and this guy said to him, he was about 19 at the time, said to him, uh, what do you think of your dad talking in AA? And my son said, you know, I'm not a member. I'm awfully happy for him. I think it's great, but I, you know. And Micah said to him, all I can tell you is since I'm a very, very little boy, the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon have taken very, very good care of me, and never once has any of them demanded that I believe what they believe. Wow. Wow. What an extraordinary thing. Talk about not playing God. Talk about not playing God being mirrored in his personal experience as a member of an AA Al-Anon family. You know? At any rate, you guys have been so attentive. You're either like on speed or just really, <laughs> re I can't tell you, you've really fed me beautifully through this morning. Thank you for your patience. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you.